Cadet County. Now recording to order. First up, we have on our workshop this morning, Public Works. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we only have one item on the consent agenda today, and that's a final acceptance and release of retainage uh, for the courthouse uh, improvement project. And that's to Lee contractors in the amount of $23,911.69. In our construction program, um, Roosevelt grade, we're still waiting for our forensic results, which uh, we should get in August, but we haven't received them yet. Now, small works guardrail project, the contractor still waiting for all the materials to get started. Uh, Courtney Road, contractors making great progress out there. Um, they're digging out unsuitable material in the lower section and replacing it, um, backfilling those holes and sections with the bad material, uh, building up the curves, some of those sharp 180 degree curves that we have in the lower section. And they also started hauling crushed rock on the upper section, which is a good sign. All right. So I think they're moving toward paving one lift this fall. So really? that's, that's good, good news. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then likely we won't get to the second lift until um, next spring. There's, there's no issues with just a single lift over the winter. No, you, that's actually common practice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because that way you find spots. Okay. I'd much rather do it then and then have the, questionable lift the final lift <clears throat> if you have any issues then you know it's a pat you do a patch and then and you put cover the new it over and okay. it's brand new yeah okay i always just think how that. deep is each lift two inches two inches mm -hmm. but there was i mean the road was just a thin crust with the chip seal yeah, a before, double shot right. before so it's more substantial than that mm -hmm. was so Let's, yeah, let's talk about the change order. I kind of, we, we related to this. I knew this was coming. Um, so the contractors wants a fuel and asphalt binder escalation, which is allowed by the contract. So, so you know, I, this, we'll start with this, the explanation. This is the asphalt binder. And the way the rule states is, is you have to take it from the day a week before the bid opened, which was this price here, which was five fifty-five a ton, on the east side. That's what the that's what the asphalt binder price is, and effective August first, the asphalt binder price is seven eighty-seven fifty a ton. So they do. There's a there's a, a math calculation you do to get where you are. So what we did is we prepared a change order. It will not be paid on August. It'll be paid whenever the time comes. But we have to bring a change order to you guys because we'll be spending, because they've already asked for the fuel escalation part of this. Instead of going back and forth, not knowing, we're asking for the change order at the $266,000. And that's still an estimate though. That's using August 1st prices because the contractors asked for June, July and from the extent of the job for fuel. And so if you look at that, the fuel escalation price is $138,000. That again, as fuel keeps going down, that price will go down. Um, the asphalt binder price is 127. That's again, using that price, we're hoping that goes down, but we're not seeing, you're not seeing much change if anything, you're seeing it go up. If you look at that, the asphalt binder and it's based on that. But that could change again, that could go down. We're gonna pave one lift this year. So this way the contract is set. Again, we would spend what we're gonna need. Now, I built, I gave you this a while ago. This is the spreadsheet I created for Courtney Road. And when we when we came to you and said, look, we need the extra half a million because we don't we don't have it. It came in. I had a two hundred. We had a two hundred thousand dollar contingency in here. 
So, and we also had a $200,000 wintering. If they pave and get to where they are today, our wintering should be very minimal. So we're not asking for more money to do this change order. We're asking for you guys to sign the change order because we don't have the ability. Yeah, so my authority is up to 50,000 thing. Right. Change orders over that, uh, the board approves, so. And we have not produced the April or the July's pay estimate because they want the fuel escalation as part of July's pay estimate. They've asked for that. So how much did you say the fuel is expected to be 138,000 up to this point? No, no, that's total. This is all total for the job. Okay. Total. This is total based on what this is, is this is calculated based on plan quantities because you get fuel escalation on just certain items like roadway X, embankment, um, watering, things that you use equipment on. You don't get it on everything. But what we did to come up with this number is we take what the plan quantities are, multiply it by the escalation rate at today, and that's what the change order states. So that gives us, so that adds to the contract Either that or we'd be coming back every month for a change order. And I don't know that we want to really do that. Again, we would only spend what the plan quantities are and also what the escalation price is at that time. It will be figured every month when we make the payment. So the 138 right now is unless unless fuel goes up again, this would be the worst case scenario. So if it comes down, it'll it comes, be less. it'll go down. Yes, yeah. but we're, right. But they want it per month on what the fuel was that month. Yes, if it goes up, it goes up, and as it goes down, it goes. Yeah, down. Yeah, and they don't get a choice. That's that's how the contract. That's is how written. it's written. Um, and so the contract, the asphalt escalation cost, they will not pay that until they actually pay. Pave. Yes, David. it's figured on the day that or figured on the week that they start paying. But they're estimating it's up to 127,000. Today. Yes, today. Yeah, and the asphalt binder isn't doesn't fluctuate as quickly as fuel prices. No. So right. even though fuel prices come down quickly, the binder doesn't no. necessarily come down as fast. Does it go up as fast? Uh a lot of times it's a little slow it's a little slow i would hope that you know if you if you're getting it on the you know it should work both ways as far as it should be yeah. even it yeah. should take longer to you know adjust it does um the state Although i seem to see when i go to the gas pump if there is something <laughs> happened in the supply yeah. somewhere which i know won't even get here for three or four months miraculously that it Immediately, it, immediately yeah. it is on there. But when it's the other way, it takes months. Well, you know, it's got to work through the system for <laughs> uh -huh. that savings to get to you. Like, huh? Okay. Well, the contractor doesn't get to make the call. That the state actually does. And so for for some contractors, it can be a bonus because, like for us, you know, we didn't pay anything near that when we got ours, because we bought ours a long, a while ago and got locked in. Right. Some of the contractors are locked in, but that doesn't matter because that's not how the thing is written. And some aren't. So they did it to protect the ones that aren't. So just so long as the contractor didn't pre-buy the asphalt when it was cheap and is now asking for an inflation, even though they've already bought it. Yeah, we can't do anything about that if they did. But we don't know if they did. Okay. We, ha we have to go by the, this escalation. Sheet. Yeah, that's the contract. That's the contract. State controls that because they say, you know, it gets then they're in the middle of the two agreements between the distributor and the, the contractor and what their contract is. Because some of the distributors say, yeah, I know, but we pay a lot more, so you're going to pay more. The nice thing with our contract is because we write it in, they have to honor that price. And I don't know what the private guys have got written into their 
ours. Or our chip seal or our oil. Chip seal oil. So yeah, we write it into ours that we're, we're locking that in. They can go out and buy that in the future for that cost, but yes. we don't know if our contractor's doing the same. We do not know. Because if the contractor did the same, then why would they get an escalation when they've already pre-bought it? Exactly. Yeah. But, but the, how is that not written into our contract that it would be expected that we do know this? Well, they're kind of at the mercy since the asphalt, the hot mix is the last thing on yeah. the job. They don't really know, you know, would they get to it this year, next year? I mean, originally we didn't think they'd get to paving any of it this year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now they're forced with whenever the contractor's ready, that's when they have to pave. Right. So it's harder harder to control that, I think. Which is why they yeah. came up with this method of, you know, kind of it there's a big unknown there and a risk for the contractor. So is there a I mean there's a fuel escalation. Is there a fuel de-escalation? So say the price like we left the contract, we got that, and the price of fuel went down do we get to deduct the, so it only works to protect for inflation, not for yes. the price going down. Yeah, because well, that's think a pretty sweet deal on it. A, is. Like a, your bid is only a bid, it's a, it's, it's a, a bid. starting bid. It's yeah. a starting bid and if costs go up, you're allowed to recoup the, but if the costs go down, you get to keep it. Yeah, yeah, mm. it's, it, you're right, it is, it's one way. It seems one way. They don't get it if it's minor. It has to be it has to be quite significant yeah. i mean and you know, that, that's more of an academic thing. Yeah. i mean i frankly i'm surprised it's as little as it is i was i was kind of bracing for it being worse that. being that that's actually a way better number where it's within the it's within the contingencies and the, mm -hmm. um and so it, are we seeing any other change orders or expecting any other change orders at this <laughs> point no we're moving along. I checked that. Our quantity seemed to be pretty good. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of dig outs, but we anticipated that on the lower section. Mm -hmm. you, the asphalt on the lower section is not very good. We knew that. We anticipated a lot of dig outs. We have a little more roadway X, but we have less rock <coughs> X, so that's actually good for us. Oh, okay, we do have less rock X. Yeah, yeah we're, at a, we're at about 130% on roadway X, but 11% on rock X. Wow. So that's pretty good. We expected a lot more rock than we found. I mean, that was at the end of July. We have we have had a shot in August, so that will go up, but we will get nowhere near the 100%. But we know we can, because the two together have to be 100%. Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll be at least 30% under our rock X at the very least. That would say we'd have rock the rest of the time, solid. So we're still sitting, we're sitting pretty good as far as that goes. Okay. Yeah, like you, I'm kind of surprised it's not more. I'm, yeah, it's actually, yeah. And I just want, for the record, everyone to also realize that this bid was also, how much under the next bid? Was it $2 million? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so even with this increase in, you know, the inflation of fuel and asphalt, we're still way below the next year's bid. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. For what people pay at the pumps. Right. Dave said, uh, well, yes, it's a lot of money. It's still yeah. considering how much they use a day in fuel. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I will bring the change order forward next yep. week then. Thank you. Can't do it today. All right, annual striping um, contract uh, phase one thermoplastic work is complete, and that's our sidewalks and our crosswalks and arrows, those kinds of things. On the design side, so we opened some bids the last uh, few weeks and uh, uh, clicked that path. I think we were double our estimate, the bid was. so. We kind of have to regroup here and look at doing some more of this in-house. Hmm. And so we will be recommending rejecting that that bid that we received for that work. I'm totally fine with that. Okay. Uh, courthouse parking lots, we were we had one bid and it was four hundred thousand dollars above um, what our estimate was, and we recommend rejecting that too. We'll do some of the work in-house. Uh, we can't do all of the work, 
Um, while we can do some concrete work, we're not really uh, experienced with curb gutter, and that's a little more. Um, it's easy. <laughs> I'm a little rusty, but <laughs> all right. Well, get okay. Out there. <laughs> We'll bring the trawl. Most then. of it's buried. So. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's we'll, the gutter piece. That's the got to get your grades right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And your curb. And you get curb, it straight. So it's straight. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's yeah. That's easy. It's more the elevations are so that you're you know because your gut you know you, the crown of the road you want you want the water to run down the gutter not yes. off the gutter onto the asphalt. <laughs> and that's could be a challenge sometimes. And actually yeah. flow down and the flow gutter. down the gutter. Right. Yeah, so we'll be regrouping on that one. Some of the work we'll do in house, and some of it we may probably have to wait until next year because the both of these projects we bid them so late because of yeah. numerous things that this is this can happen, and everybody's super busy. So you get a high bid because they're going to do it when uh, everybody's you know. busy. Yeah. Do we, if I may, do we is there work that we can do so that we could open at least some of it for use you know over the winter yeah like if we you know prep things i understanding that it's going to cause some more work later because you have to go in and kind of re i'm just kind of anticipating you know we've been telling people oh you know Thanks for being patient. I know it's been hard, and but we're we're almost there, and we're gonna have all this parking, and it's just gonna be wonderful. And now we have to say, oh yeah, no, it's you got to make it through the winter, and we'll do it next year. And so it'd be nice, maybe again, if it's impractical. Um, I mean, I allude to. I mean, it's it's similar to. I always tell people. Please don't move into your house before I'm done building it. Because it's yes, you can, but it's not a good idea because it will cause trouble later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. So I that's just I'm I, I don't know. I'll I'll take your recommendation either way. But is it Yeah, we're gonna look at the pieces we can do, you know, really to finish uh, the lot over here where Annex three was and five. Um, there's some drainage work in the intersection down there, and then we have that bulb out that we have to remove. So there's some things that we need to do. We'll do as much as we can and our crews can do. And then, you know, the paving, if we can get that lot prepped um, and ready to go, we might be able to get it paved. Annex one lot is, I mean, really it's prepped and ready to pave, except for, you know, you usually do the curb and gutter and sidewalk first, um, but it doesn't mean we can't. But that one, that lot's farther away, but um, the lot behind the jail was prepped. We just temporarily chip sealed it. Um, we'll be looking at, you know, how can we get some of this stuff accomplished and so people can park. Yeah, it's we like are, I'm, we I are. mean, I can park on gravel. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and if it's not, that's that's fine. If it makes sense not to do it, yeah, we'll just take the. We'll try. Though. Yeah, heat is fine because I think people would understand. You know, yeah, you could have had it this fall if you did. You really want us to spend four hundred thousand dollars of or your money more, for yeah. this, yeah. or is it worth four hundred thousand dollars to wait to yeah. next year? Yeah, mm -hmm. or I'll guess I should be accurate and say potentially because we don't know. Yes. No, we don't know. We don't know that we're suddenly we're going to be on budget next year. Yeah, if we wait, mm -hmm. but I suspect it'll be less. We're going to save something. Because that bid was yeah, yes. like the primo. Yeah, being early is always good mm -hmm. in bidding. Okay, the other couple projects on the list, the Rock Creek Bridge painting project, we'll be getting that one ready for a early 2023 advertisement. Uh, Sundale Road, Old Highway 8, uh, design work continues on that. Uh, let's see, maintenance projects. Um, we had some issues with the chip spreader, so I think it's fixed and ready to go now, but we'll start next week. Chip, or, uh, chip ceiling on the, the east side, Goldendale East. Um, right now, the crews are uh, working on the radio tower site still and doing some grading and patching. West End crews are patching. Um, so they finished their chip seal work and are dropping back and patching. Uh, facility side, um, I think one of the, uh, we're still waiting for our um, 
the word back from the HVAC people on the few remaining issues in this building. Um, the wireless bridge to Annex 4, so we right now have a, we have one cable that runs across from the courthouse roof that was supposed to be wrecked out at some point in time. Uh, one, and then we moved Juvenile in there, so we kept it, uh, but we found a way to have a wireless bridge that will be installed next week that will allow us to get rid of that last cable and disconnect it and get rid of it. So for a fairly economical uh, way to do it. So we looked at stringing a cable, connecting it back up to this building, but it just that those methods were all really pretty expensive compared to this. And since it's temporary, a temporary connection to that building um, until they move out, um, there's no sense in spending a lot of money. Um, not really anything new on the HVAC replacements. Um, radio tower site. Radio tower site. Uh, the carpenters are up. We've uh, we poured the walls and footings. Um, on Friday, we pour the floor. We put in the uh, propane lines, and uh, PUD puts in the main power on Thursday. Temp powers in. Um, so we should be energized. We went through our electrical inspection. We're good. So we will energize this week. So that'll be good. And uh, we'll just we'll keep it moving forward. Uh, we're hoping to have the shelter constructed middle of September. And it will be complete. And then we're going back and forth. Tower to get the tower up or get it out to bid. You know, I'm concerned about the prices on that. Um, they're still saying the lead time is eight to 10 weeks. We'll see. I think that's a little op option. Our optimistic, optimist, very optimistic. Yeah, very optimistic. But our, I'll be honest, our time is starting to run low because by the time you bid it, the contractor is awarded and then they order the towel. It's, I don't know that we're going to get there. Even eight weeks this year. Yeah. this year. Yeah, I don't know that you're going to get there. Everything else will be in place. And then it'll be a matter of when you can get up there, you put the tower in and you should be pretty much ready to go with, with a few other things. But we're also working on the licensing and all that at the same time. So that's still moving forward. Um, our... Big event in August at the fairgrounds is obviously fair. And uh, so our crews are working on that. We're kind of recruiting other people from the office because we just can't fill the spots that are open. And uh, so we'll we'll do what we can. I think some of the, the requests uh, for maintenance work will be um, prioritized and we may not get to some of the other things that um, can wait. So uh, just because we don't have enough people to do everything. And after fair, then we'll, we'll get back to and finish up those backlog of things that need to be fixed and maintained. Um, follow up issues. So I, I, there was an email that uh, Lee sent quite a while ago and said it might come up, but it never did. And I keep thinking about it. And I actually put it on the list. I don't know what we'll be able to do with this. I think other than route. just, just maybe communicate it to the watchdot folks so that they're aware. I mean, we, you know, we always, it's, it's difficult for people to understand that we're not every road in the county is here, yeah. it's mm -hmm. us. It's, um, and that's really about all we can do as far as just let them know. I know crosswalks and you know, have been a struggle with Wash Dot, where they really don't want them; they want to get rid of them. And yeah. so it seems like every time they, um, you know, repave, there's one less. <laughs> yeah, it's just like the railroad. <laughs> yeah, it's like the railroad. <laughs> yep. Every crossing, there's like there's always one less. One less. <laughs> and so it's. I mean, that's really, although I will say, I think if we make a concerted effort to communicate with WashDOT, you know, we've saw that in, in Murdoch with the speed stuff where they did 
modify like their original plan to what it it wasn't what the community was asking for but it was more than what they had originally were said they were going to do and so it did move the needle and i think it's the same thing with the crosswalk situation um, particularly in lyle they, yeah you know because i remember there used to be four and i think we're down to uh, one or two one or two and, now yeah. and uh, you know and i know the goal is None. 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 Yeah. And so yeah. I think they're there, you know, safety is a big issue for Washdot. And I think like we saw in Murdoch, um, I think if we if maybe we get uh, these people in contact with Dave Berkey. Right. You know, that seems to be a good avenue to yeah. get it to their attention where they need to respond. You know, if it's people parking, you know, too close to the crosswalk so you can't see, they don't want that either. Mm -hmm. And then the speeding issue is, you know, kind of an ongoing thing. Right, and, that's, yeah. Yeah, state patrol. Yeah, and so. I would say, you know, living there, it's, it doesn't seem that chronic to me. I'm not, I, I think most folks, like, I think it's, you know, there are folks that just think the speed limit is wrong and they should be able to roar through town at 55 miles an hour. And, but I think the bulk of people, it, they do yeah. comply and they, you know, we, we go the speed limit. Yeah. Although I'm still adapting to Murdoch, I will be, I will be <laughs> <Yeah>. honest. <laughs> I'm glad they put the thing on the road because that's yeah. about what I noticed. <laughs> it's like, what does that say? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh huh. And Good then, idea. So by the time it, you know, goes to the lowest, I'm there, but it's a, <laughs> It's a much steeper deceleration than you're supposed to have. <laughs> but you get there. Yeah, yeah. But I do get there. At least you're going uphill. Uh, yeah, and I'm going uphill. So, um, yeah, so I don't know if there's a way. Maybe, I mean, I can do that because I know the French is from, they did reach out. I had responded, and then I didn't hear anything from them for quite some time. And then um, last week while I was gone, I see there was another, I think last Thursday or Friday, there was another just to follow, they responded to mine from two weeks before and just was asking for more information. And I think probably the best is that we need to get anybody that has those mm -hmm. is get them to the right contact right. directly. Yeah, because yeah, it's impossible if you don't know. Right, if you don't To know. find the right person. The right person, because yeah. the, you know, WashDOT's a big yes. kind of monolithic organization. And they're not, they're not in the office. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the last one on my list is more for Dan. We have a meeting on Friday, so to discuss the artwork with mm -hmm. with the historic, historic society. Oh, okay. Yeah. The building. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, and then we have the other thing we kind of discussed. Yeah, last. And I will actually go to page two of the sheet because that's because um, there was maybe writing a uh, a grant to uh, for um, landfill gas for this. Um, we've updated the costs because when these were first done, they were done in 2020. And I'll be honest, we looked around, tried to get it as it's forty percent increase. Oof. That's what we're seeing. Um, and what I did is highlighted the stuff in yellow, and talking to the PUD, talking to our consultant. This is the stuff that needs to be done to deal with the RFO phosphate. That would, you know, probably help sell our permit to DOE, our discharge permit, which now sits in the uh, um, kind of la-la land type of a scenario. I mean, it's, it's actually expired, but they're letting us still run with a temporary. But there's a lot of money there, I'll be honest. It's $2.5 million this week. You know, so is this expected every 20 years on these systems, this uh, sort of a major renovation? Yes, 
And so you would renovate this. These actually include the upgrades for what would take care of the orthophosphate, but that's not a huge cost. It's like, for instance, you're looking at new, um, new telemetrics. The telemetrics is probably, for instance, this telemetrics costs is $130,000. Of that $130,000, maybe $25,000 of that is extra cost to, to make it take care of the, help it take care of the orthophosphate. Um, and honestly, you probably see that anyway, because what it allows it to do is allows it to, the plant to shut down on its own for one hour every day, or in the lowest time, say two, three in the morning. It'll actually shut the plant down and allows bugs to grow to, that'll mm -hmm. eat the phosphate. Uh, we don't have that system in place now, and we shouldn't have. I mean, when we built it, it wasn't, wasn't really a, something oh, yeah. that was available. But I guess if you want me to write the grant, I'm looking for what, I don't know what the ballpark is for landfill gas, or how much we would go after, or what the, what the thought is. Well, I was looking at the, project, yeah, proposed, the, pro project. the proposed project lists already. So is, um, because the PUD is proposing not, you know, between everything that every they want to do and the little bit that we wanted to do, not including this, it basically consumes the whole fund balance of that fund. Mm -hmm. um, which I, and I don't know if some of these could be pushed out as far as their projects right. that they're bringing. This is give them everything they want. That's what it would take. There's a little bit. There would be, you know, and there is 250,000. Is that right? A year flows into that fund. So that's the as of this year. And so there will be, I mean, there will be additional uh, dollars in there. Um, but I don't see based on the, so I don't, there's not enough money to do everything they want and everything we want. In the time frame that everybody wants to do it, there there will be a deficit in the fund, and so somebody's going to have to give as far as push the time on some things. Um, you know, there will be eventually, and it's not a huge. I mean, within a couple of years, you know, there you push things out. You can't do your whole list, but maybe you can do most of your list, and within a couple of years, there's enough there's enough revenue coming in to pay for everything. Um, yeah, should be uh, well. And all this doesn't have to be done. Well, at not once. that. Yeah. Right. All this does not have to be done at once. Right. I mean, it's all part of. So is there, so Dan's idea was to use, to pull off the Goldendale wastewater treatment plant improvements and use $0.09 like we already have it set aside and then do a project in this one in order to make up that, that 250,000. But I mean, the only one I'm seeing that really falls in that range is the aerobic digester aeration and mixing improvements. Yeah, the stuff is expensive. I mean, you and know, so what is the MCC replacement? Yeah, I was curious what that is. MCC is it's uh, it's it's I can't remember. That makes me feel better, actually. <laughs> 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 oh, I can't believe this. Off the list. If we don't know what it is, oh, we must not know. No, 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 no. Well, it says we already have one if we're replacing it. Well, we yeah. do have one, yes. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the whole SOC computer system, basically. The computer system is $900,000? Because it opens and closes all the gates and operates all the stuff. Is it not working? It is working, but it is getting to the obsolete stage. Again, this stuff, and this is 2025. So, you know, Dan asked for the stuff. So that's why this is the project list. What you see here is the project list that needs to be done that's not developer driven. Now, if you remember, it's like a $7 million price Overall, tag. But, but all that 
<clears throat> excuse me, the rest of that stuff is based on development. So if you don't have the development, you don't have to do it. And you can, you know, the idea is, is you raise your, your uh, development fees enough cover that covers that. So that's not an issue. The rest of it's not a real problem. It's this piece here for the plant that's not, is not developer driven. This is, this All is, of these are not <clears throat> developer driven. None of these are developed. These are so, de so we have two point five million dollars in costs in the next three years, and we have how much sitting in that account? Right now, one point four in the landfill gas. No, 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 in the account with oh. the wastewater account. Oh, there. it's two hundred thousand or something. Uh, there's there's about that much. Yeah, uh, about the PD net has. Yeah. yeah, net. Well, I'm just because yeah. we're gonna have this meeting down there and. It's not doesn't look pretty when you've had 20 years to prepare for what you know is going to be replacement of all these systems. And you've got 2.5 million in cost and only 200,000 sitting there on an enterprise fund that's supposed to pay for itself nearly pay for itself. Well, but that just is the why you have to have the whole conversation with the community is the rates they have were, to be adjusted. Yes, they're, they they're were, not. They've never been. Yeah, they considered this. If you go back to the original rate study, they looked at all this stuff. Hey, we should collect it. the rates would be a hundred dollars a month, and but there was a decision made that no, this is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. We're not collecting for that. That's I'm talking to PUD. Some of this stuff could be pushed out. They're willing to take the risk. Some of this stuff could be, you know, what could, could be pushed out. Some of these different items could be pushed out. Um, we have to come up with a good plan, though, if we want to get our permit, our permit renewed, renewed, because that's probably the worst skeleton in the closet is ha not having our discharge, having our discharge permit hasn't been renewed. And, you know, it's been back and forth because there's been so much turnover at DOE. Um, but it's something that we need to address or at least have a very good plan to address so we can finish our plan, submit that and move forward. And, you know, the idea is, is, you know, we'd go to DOE and say, you know, we're not made of money. We can't just come up with 2.5. Here's our plan over a five year period, 10 year period to, to make these replacements. And you know we're looking at increasing fees or whatever. I don't want to get in your realm. I apologize, but you know no, that is. I mean that it to me. That's, that's the answer. That's yeah. the answer is, and that's. I mean, in my mind, that's the point of the meeting with the community is to we've got to start the conversation with them and show them all the stuff. And it's like you, you know, we should have been collecting more all along. But mm -hmm. we didn't because there was a decision made that we were just going to subsidize the system and we're the subsidies over. And so now you've got to pay your own way. And this is that's part of the plan is that we're, you know, we're going to have to play around with those rates because this this won't this won't cash flow the, at the current rates. Mm -hmm. It can with a rate adjustment and we could play with what that is as far as how much you know if you push some things out and you did like there is a path that you know we get the rate adjusted to what is basically the average rate with all the other wastewater plants in mm -hmm. the county the system will pay its own way yeah. because all the other ones do yeah. and there's nothing special about this system that is inherently more expensive to operate than any of the other systems it's just you've got to get that you got to generate more revenue from from rates to pay its own way and that's a difficult conversation for that community because if you have been if you've been subsidized for the last 20 years none of us like to pony up, more. Pony up and it's like i mean it's not a I, I mean i don't think i think when we looked at the numbers i mean it's it's not insignificant but it's no you know it's like i think immediately yeah. really the i mean the the recommendation I think is going to be immediately starting in 23 it it needs to go it's a 10 dollar 
a month increase just to set that and then the escalators like everybody else have that's in there and then the financial picture looks a lot better yes. where it gets you way closer i think there still needs to be some grant that's still not going to get you to it's not going to get you to that it, all these big projects no but these i think the idea would be these projects don't need to be built like you can spread them out a little more so that you can generate you can generate some cash. You have more time to generate that cash to be able, and you're still going to have to have some grants. Yeah, there is can, no way. These are down. some really big capital things that you really should have been saving for the last 10 years to pay for. And so now you're trying to cut, you can't put it off for 10 years. Yeah. No. And the other part of that is 10 years from now, it will just cost more. Yeah, more. So you got to catch up and there's going to have to be some, and that's a discussion we're going to have to have the PUD over the landfill gas fund is that I know these are your priorities, but I don't see Dallasport on here. Mm -hmm. And so it's time to, you know, we can all give a little bit and. So I guess the question is, is do we have something here that we need to do in Dallasport now that would go for the, you know, LFG funds that we would then hold over the engineering for the 0 0.09 dollars leave that there mm -hmm. take gold and switch it off but I mean do we have something there that we're willing to spend that money on because I don't know what's more important I mean an oxidization ditch aeration or the digester or, or, or like that gets all the time to do all the yeah state, all of them so it, it's just a sequence so I guess right and so we need a big plan on the sequence right. on what comes when because if we don't have a project that is that we can actually do and accomplish then we'll just leave Goldendale on there and it was a good idea Dan but we can do any I guess my question back is how much money do we have to spend because all of them are independent of each other to, to some degree right but what's but the you, but you can only but you, you know can, you can only fund you can't fund a half a project right you can you can't fund well, it. you got to do them in a chunk whatever project. a chunk is and right what is that and so if we were not going to move you know so at least 250 if, if you, you weren't going to if you weren't going to move 250 then we would do we would, we would do the uh telemetry plant panel replacement project because we could afford to do that And is that needed right now? Like, like that is needed in twenty twenty four. So yes, that that has a quicker path to needing because a lot of that it operates the way the rest of equipment operate that in the oxidation ditch. Those are the two critical items that need to be done first or should be done first, um, and then the rest of them follow. So yeah, one of those two would be the project to take off. I mean, if you wanted to do one, it would be that. And the oxidation ditches, you know, that's a that's a lot more expensive project. That's six hundred thousand dollars. You know, or do you not do, or do you just save it? Nobody says or, you have to spend. Right, or you save it and then you do. If you save two fifty for twenty three and another two fifty in twenty four. I get you to five you're getting close and there is actually i mean you could because there's you still have projects there's, on the camera. i mean it would take the fund to zero yeah. but so right. my we'll issue see. is just like when you we might use want to nine dollars it was that you know that's for engineering on the wastewater treatment right plant. and when i look at 0 0.09 i'm looking at other things primarily with 0 0.09 dollars I know it's pumps and pipes for you know economic development and growth. Um, There's one other project that is not on this list okay. that is in the budget that we've pushed off and pushed off, and PUD's asking for it. You know, so this is something that has to be done. It's actually on this list. I didn't highlight it. I should have. It's the clarifier. You remember it it's been, it's on, been on there for a long time yeah. we, we and we kept we kept kicked the can down we replaced one we haven't replaced the other one 
It's actually, I, I did not highlight it, but it is actually. Build uh, East clarifier. Yes, there you go. Um, what's the price on it? it 450. Matter. It's in the blue under the 2022 20, budget. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, we, we did one, they did one previously, they rebuild them. Yeah. And they've rebuilt one, there's two of them. And so this is the second one. So this one's in the proposed budget for this year, um, twenty three. Yes. But we only have. But we didn't fund. You we haven't fund seen it. it. You yet. haven't seen it yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's in the proposed budget for twenty three, is would that be using two hundred fifty thousand of landfill gas the more appropriate place for that? That would. Be, that would be your guys' yeah. call. Yeah, we're not I sure mean, if that's how you want to do it or yeah. not. But yeah, that, that needs to be done. Two hundred and fifty more, one hundred and fifty thousand more dollars in the actual fund after that. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. So the the thing to remember about the uh, the dollars that PUD has, there's that we've collected over the years that provides that buffer. So they can't if we have an emergency, they can't or something comes up. They can't spend their own money and then get reimbursed. They have to have somebody, they can't use their funds or somebody else's funds to pay for our plant repairs or improvements. So it is good to have, keep some kind of a buffer there so that they can respond and react. Well, with that 450, is that gonna drain most of that account? No, we were gonna come to, to you guys for additional money the 23 budget for that yeah. so general fund dollars or usually it's been landfill fund. Landfill yeah. dollars. Yes. so this that's why we wanted to bring it up if you're looking at that maybe we do landfill gas or there's other avenues So there's 1.2 in the fund. Landfill gas. Yeah, or 1.3 in essence at the end of this year. And 125,000 anticipated. So we we're asking for 250 for Goldendale. Would it make sense to ask for 250 for Dallasport as well? And then that's 500 and then I mean, I'm just going into the negotiations. I'm trying right. to think, you know, what would be fair and where. Yeah, and then they're going to have to reprioritize, you know, their list. But we need a pretty good write-up of why, you know, they've got write-ups for all theirs. And they're saying, you know, these are much smaller systems that can't pay for themselves or aren't paying for themselves. Well, again, I would just show them this. <laughs> I agree. We'll provide, if that's what you want, we'll provide the, the application. I mean, that would, be, that would be my, you know, big statement is, is that, you know, this is for, I mean, it was budgeted for 2022. We're going to drain 450,000 of the fund balance on this. Um, and why didn't you come forward and ask for, why didn't they, since they've been running this thing, why didn't, why isn't that on this list? Because the county's just wrote checks for everything at Dallas. Typically, yeah. Right. Yes. We've never spent one dime of landfill gas at the wastewater plant because. Mm -hmm. Why spend that money on that when the county will just pay for everything? Yeah, I don't want to know what we're to truly into that thing. So I don't, but I also don't want to drain the whole LFG fund. So, 
Would you be good with that? Yeah, I would be. I mean, I think that's a reasonable. Yeah, so we'll probably get something put together for the 250. Yeah, and we, yeah, uh, and we need to get fund. that sent over so that they can review it. I'll have it next week for you. That when works. Yeah, let me make sure. Is that meeting? Twenty. I thought it was the 16th. It's the oh, it's Friday the twenty sixth. Oh, okay. Yeah. So next week we'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. That's it for our list. I'm sure, we went over. Yep, that's our fault. We missed having a good long discussion though. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have gotten so fast, you know. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Director King. Good morning. Good morning. You have updated sheets for us or what we had in our packet? I, there are updates. I have no additional copies for you at this time. Okay. I will, I will fill you in as I go. Uh, the first one, uh, we did make uh, something on the consent agenda. Thank you to HR, an authorization to advertise for the administrative assistance position. And i um, happy to report that the uh, recruitment for that position has gone well. So far, we have applications that are promising. Um, but that is on your consent agenda for this afternoon. Um, the public safety radio system. Um, what I talked to you about uh, five weeks ago or so was the uh, intermittent key ups in the system. Uh, I was notified yesterday at our bi monthly uh, radio system meeting that those have now been determined to be a receive issue at Kaiser. So they've narrowed that down or are going to continue to work and have uh, <clears throat> plans for next steps or resolution. I was also made aware that the, uh, which is not on your list, the generator has failed to start uh, at testing at the ClickAttat site. So I've engaged Public Works because that is a brand new generator there. We just upgraded that site to its own a new room in the fire station there and put in that new generator. So um, make sure that we don't do anything there and it's, if it's still under warranty and so on that the Public Works is involved in that process. But right now we have no, um, backup power if the grid fails there besides the uh, batteries. Uh, maintenance side, still in the process of the tier one and tier three radio equipment uh, preventative maintenance cycle. Um, and the facilities uh, preventative maintenance was completed. They did note that the flat top fence um, is smashed more and more. If you remember last year, we chose not to repair that. So it is just getting worse. We'll be looking into that. There's also um, issues with the uh, exterior wall in the seam. That's a prefab building. And it is starting to swell and split, uh, apparently because of water impingement that then froze and all that good stuff. So we'll be looking into that and see how we can deal with that repair. Uh, uh, the other things are on hold. There's going to be many things on hold because of our staffing situation. The Burdoin site um, has been completed and was tested 100% um, reliable. So that repairs was done just last week. The Diamond Gap low temp uh, alarm situation that's astounds uh, responsibility was actually resolved by our support personnel on their annual PM visit. They were, they were able to fix that while well there. I'm still working to get an answer out of Astound for the flat top security camera fault. The really great news for, I guess, operations and maintenance of the radio system is that the PUD has put in underground power to that site. Flat top. The flat top, correct, sorry. And, um, you know, that's a big win because that was the site that was always going down and we had to take extra propane one year. 
because of a eight day power outage. So very glad to have underground power lines to that remote site. Was that eight day outage on the lines going up or was that a good portion of Trout Lake as well? No, just the, the lines to the site. And actually we refilled the tanks on day eight. The, the power outage went through day nine. But yes, that was that site that goes from Forest Road 88 mm -hmm. um, up the hill there. There's no residences beyond that. So um, beyond our emergency communications need and uh, AT&T and U.S. Cellular who are also there, you know, there's no no homes and that's a it's to, can so be their last up, priority. Just upgraded that on their own dime or? Yes, after many, many years of struggles and us I've lobbied for that since before I became the director because it was an issue. And, and that very first year, the winter of 2014, 2015, yeah, no, 2015, 16 is when we had that multi-day outage and we paid for the propane. It's, and they, when their crews, they've had to borrow um, larger snowcats from BPA and so on to get there during these winter storms and to repair them. So it was in everybody's best interest. And yes, they did fund that all on their own. Okay, that's great. Yes, very thankful. <clears throat> yeah, and their, their past ops manager was a big part of that. And he wanted that to be his, one of his legacy items before he retired. He almost made it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Nope. Under radio site leases, uh, mostly under on hold due to time constraints. However, flat top site land lease with the DNR is in the uh, final approval at the state with their legal, and uh, then they'll be sending it to us for signatures. Um, I've not been able to get any indication out of them as to what kind of cost increases um, going forward. If there'll be a big jump or it will just maintain the annual increases as it was before. So we weren't yet able to put that into the budget that submitted yesterday. Um, but I will let you know as soon as I have that number. Um, the radio project, as you heard from Public Works on the um, shelter construction, also coordinating the grounding plan, which is a very significant thing and something that was either left out or done inappropriate at a lot of our other sites in the original phase of the project. Working through to make sure that that gets done appropriately um, in consultation with our support. And working with the, con the consultant also on the FCC licensing. Um, we're going to have to modify that license because the uh, physical location of the site was moved um, about a quarter mile and 400 feet in elevation up. So there's some challenges there with our neighbors uh, to the north in Yakima County and hopefully they will be cooperative so that we can get that place licensed sooner rather than later and also facilitating the design work of the public safety microwave system <coughs> at that site back to the dispatch uh, the emergency management building um, for both the public safety microwave and the security system feed which would be a commercial grade microwave link. It's, that's been determined to be the most cost effective, two separate ones. Any questions about the radio system? No, sir. 911 call taking and public safety radio dispatching. Um, Phil is working a shift again today, so that's why he's not with me. Um, and the call volume report not available at this time. I did the EMS district in their uh, board meeting a couple weeks ago reported that the July EMS calls um, are up significantly year over year. So I um, thought I would add that for you. That all is stuff that comes to us first and we generate the calls for them. So um, yeah, there's debate about why we're seeing more and more medical calls, you know, COVID, some, but the um, fact that a lot of people put off their routine medical appointments and, and procedures 2020, 2021, and now that is catching up with them. That's what I'm hearing from the hospital 
uh, CEOs and so on in the, in the healthcare in the state in general is why the beds are so full because we're still continuing to have to transfer people like way out of our area for medical. The, the beds locally are not there and not just like MCMC or Portland, Vancouver, but we can't get them into Cadillac or we're sending them to Spokane, all those things. So <clears throat> Spokane and Seattle more and more often. Um, staffing for 911 dispatch remains at a critical state. Um, we've got four comms officers out of the uh, schedule right now. Um, three of those are in training and going well. One of those is on uh, leave. Um, and we're preparing for the budget supplemental request. Um, I, I think we're going to need to make that request uh, at the end of this month. I think the 25th is the deadline for that submission. So uh, I don't think we'll be able to go any farther into the year without uh, making that request in this round. And then uh, to, to cover those wages and benefits in overtime because of the staffing shortage. Uh, and we, I have to say publicly that we appreciate your support. Uh, when I came to you a couple of weeks ago, as well as our law enforcement, fire and EMS partners, um, and the three communications officers that agreed to come back and work for us that have, have left for other employment in the past, um, that made all the difference. So thank you for giving me the ability to do that and for all those folks to help us out. We are continuing to advertise for the full three full-time training positions um, and see how that goes so we can continue to adapt and make sure that we uh, account for the attrition in training and the turnover. So we're planning ahead for that. Operations and training side, the 911 phone system update project uh, has been completed, additional uh, punch list items and upgrades are still in the process in the near future as time allows. Right now, time doesn't allow for much. One of those is the text to 911 project um, that we've been trying to get done for about two years now. Um, the state wanted everybody in the state to go to text to 911 by the end of last year. Um, that did not happen. We're not the only ones still trying to pull that off. The uh, state access, so this is all the criminal justice information systems that we use, um, is the remote technical audit is now completed. So that is, both pieces of that is complete. Uh, item that's not on your list there is uh, the new mental health crisis services and procedures update for us, for 911 dispatch to communicate a request from law enforcement, the jail, or even the hospital at times. Um, it's going very well. Had our first weekly uh, meeting this morning about that. I did have time to sit in on that. Uh, we did have two requests over the weekend for that service. From our perspective, it went very well. There were some glitches um, between that service provider, our new service provider, and the hospital, the ED staff. But um, they're working that out. And uh, my input to everyone on that call this morning was that it is already vastly better than what we've had for a long time. And thanks to everybody that worked on it and everybody that is currently taking those calls for mental health crisis requests, um, they were efficient, responded quickly. And we had no hassles because in the past, literally, it was a fight for dispatch to get a response um, to law enforcement or jail requests. So, so is that we did two ITAs this weekend or we had one IT, I know of one ITA, but then was the other just a, the crisis responder, the lifeline side? Correct, yes. Okay. As we discussed on Friday, our first, the first request is to the uh, crisis triage line, the, the lifeline service, and then from there, they make the decisions how to proceed. My understanding from the call this morning is yes, there was one DCR 
involvement. Um, the DCR was at the hospital at the same time the second one came in. So she was there to see how that went down and that was where there were some issues with um, how it was handled and they're working their way through that. Any other questions? Thank okay. you for the update. Sorry, I wasn't on the phone call this morning. It was canvassing board. Not a problem. That's part of why I'm here. Um, the fire district user agreements um, were down to just one left to be received. So as of the fourth, which is phenomenal speed to get those agreements back from the fire districts. So we're very happy about that. And we have been in touch with that one fire district and, and they are getting that back to us sooner rather than later. It's all signed, they just haven't returned it. So no issues this time like we had last time. Any questions about 911 dispatch? Um, <clears throat> the emergency management program. Um, I put the outdoor burn ban uh, code update on hold again due to our current staffing and hopefully get back to that in September uh, after I get uh, Phil back on some admin duties out of dispatching so much. The wildfire report and um, what you see, what you have on your list there is an overview. Um, there was one additional request for mutual aid yesterday. Fire District 10 went to Benton County, um, but knock on wood and all that. I'm not a superstitious person, but others are. Um, we have not had a significant wildfire in our county uh, yet, although there's been a couple of close calls. The, um, the fire on the third um, on Highway 14 at mile marker 114 um, came very, very close right up to their, their barn, it's their stockyard and the, the homestead house. And they were able to hit it around and keep it from burning those structures. So we're dodging bullets so far. On the training and exercise side, um, had training for the DM volunteers on the 14th. Um, had volunteer meeting and training again this month on the 4th and all based around being able to respond either with the mobile command post vehicle or the EOC uh, stand up for significant incidents in our county. Uh, we've also added the uh, ability um, with the new Starlink system for internet service that um, we've been able to test that and determine that it doesn't need to come as part of the mobile command post. We can just take it out there and we're working on getting the appropriate case for it. Um, but you can just take it out there and set it up as long as you have 110 power, which we could also provide the generator for. So uh, we took it, um, yeah, last month to the Fire Chiefs Association meeting at Wakaiakis, which is a remote site, not very good cell phone service, no internet at their fire hall. And, um, you know, it's in the trees. That, there's just enough carved out of the woods there for their fire hall in the parking lot. Set it outside the door of their fire station and and uh, got internet access. Ran the cable in the door and provided internet for a go-to meeting for the EMS council and a Zoom meeting for the Fire Chiefs Association. And so we can do that anywhere in the county if they needed for mapping or whatever else, command and control. Just set it out right next to their fire vehicle with a whisper quiet generator that we already have. And, and uh, they have the ability to have Wi-Fi phone calls on their cell phones and so on. Even if they don't have cell service, that would provide that as well. So we're excited about that. Yeah, as a single resource deployment, you just throw it in the back of any rig and, and go where you need it. So. And it is also, if we don't use it every month, it will be cheaper than what we were doing and paying for every month. This is only pay as you go. So even if we use it every month, it will be a very, very small amount more than what we were paying for. What remind me, what is the monthly charge? 130, 135, I believe for the RV version of Starlink. It's, I think it's 110 for the home version and 135 for okay. the, but you only pay for the months that you turn you it actually on. actually use. Yeah. And in our scenario, emergency response, you know, that won't be every month. We will have trainings and exercises that we will use it. 
but don't you need to shut it off if you don't use it? Like if you have to put it into suspend mode or whatever. You can, yes, deactivate yeah, it you have to deactivate when you're not using it. Otherwise, it's just on. Otherwise, it'll just keep charging. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, like we else. deactivate <laughs> it. Yeah, we deactivate it for the months we're not going to use it. The, the great part is you don't have to, like sat phone service, if you were doing it that way, instead of just paying a monthly fee to have it, um, you don't have to call in to activate it. You just turn it on and it sets itself up and then it activates your service for that month. So you, yeah. If, otherwise, you drive out there and you yeah. turn it on, you're like, oh, it's deactivated. Oh, yeah. How do I activate it? How do I activate it? You can't so, without no service. service. Yeah. Right. We, and even locally, if we don't have internet access, you know, like we had yesterday evening, the county lost internet access and all the phones went down and so on. Um, just drop it in the parking yeah. lot and provide our own. Yeah. And if you don't have internet access or phone service, you can't log on to activate it. So they have solved that problem. Yeah, that is almost one thing to think about doing is, is having one sitting up on top of the building for your emergency backup when fiber goes down. Yep. For the 911 dispatch functions and criminal justice information, which is like the most critical in the 911 phone system, um, there are security issues with doing that and latency even, but mostly security. Um, having it as a backup that we'd have to work through and make sure we have all the right IT pieces between mm -hmm main service and this backup service but that is something that we've already discussed and we just need the time to look into yes yeah and it would be uh, far better than paying i think it helped us out a couple of years ago to get a redundant um, internet connection for us for 911 and our criminal justice information it was several thousand dollars a year just to have it sitting there waiting for us so if we can make this work and see just security rules and precautions can be put in place, the FBI signs off on that, then it would be an option. Um, what else? Can I go through the grants? Um, the usual things. Uh, we're still waiting on FEMA to approve the unmanned aerial systems um, policies and procedures. We have uh, in the process of renewing that grant agreement with the state because it lapsed at the end of July because we've been waiting for FEMA for so long. Um, but that is in the works and that should be extended sometime into July next year, I think it is. But we fully intend to get that project done by the end of this year. Um, talked about the CASIFA meeting and demonstrating that already. Um, Frank and uh, went to the Trout Lake Community Fair this Saturday at their request and did public education and so on. Um, that was a good event. He reported to me yesterday. Um, and I think that's everything. I still haven't had a chance. I brought it just in case you had questions, but the National Significant Wildfire uh, Potential Outlook uh, came out for August through November. and. Uh, be reviewing that, but from a cursory view, it's, nothing's going to change. It's a pretty standard year. We're now at the beginning of August in that high likelihood for um, significant wildfires, uh, August through September. Do they, I haven't, I haven't seen it, but do they account for um, the severity as far as rangeland fires with the amount of fuels? Like I was somewhere yesterday morning hiking around and you know oh my god it was yeah. four feet in some places it was i have never like it was hard to walk through it was just grassland and it was so it was on the west end but i have never seen it like that and i just think wow if we got a fire in here just the severe and it was sort of a grassland timber interface and i you know it you know things look good as far as the trees are good everything's green but i think the severity of the like this isn't going to just flash through because there's so much fuel there that and so i don't know if they kind you know i know that's a hard thing to probably quantify but they'll flash through that high they, grass they're, they they add it to their it'll predictive. It'll flash through, but I mean, it's it's going to be hot. Well, it'll, it'll, yeah, it, it will still. 
No, it was ungrazed and it was scary. <laughs> I was scared just walking through. And that's some of the talks we've had with fire chiefs and DNR and so on that I've been involved with is when the, the light fuels dry out completely because they're, they're just now doing that, you know, down to the base of the stem. Otherwise, these fires that we're talking about would have just taken off and would have been uncontrollable. We would have already lost structures, um, similar to what uh, they're doing in South Wasco County. Yep. You know, there's an 11,500 acre fire down there in the last two weeks, um, which we sent significant mutual aid to. And even just across the river in, in the Dalles, they've had is it three fires right around the or, yeah, 197 and 84 interchange right there um, on the east end of the Dalles. Mm -hmm. That's burnt at least twice, and we've sent help to them for that. Um, but when that does finally dry out, if it's not already, the next fire starts will be more significant because it's light fuel, but it's still a heavy load of light fuel. So it won't, it won't just flash fast and low like it did before. Those flame links will be more like brush rather than grass this, in these conditions. So those are the discussions we've had and the fact that we all need to be on alert for a quicker response as well as quicker um, request for mutual aid uh, for from in county as well as DNR and the fire bosses, although they're on contract with ODF uh, at Dallasport, they can still be available at request. So I that makes me much more comfortable what we've seen in the last couple of years with having the they, they have been a game changer I think yeah. as far as in our region that those yes, are they that's have. a great investment thank you ODF yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, we, especially we're spending Oregon's money staging yeah. that. Yeah. They, I know we get reimbursed drop, we yeah, get, they get their we get, pay they get we get a bill for it yeah, we have yeah. to pay for it but, but the standby time they pay for it yeah and the um, yeah the other concern is that the DNR is like everybody else, short-staffed. They've also moved their operations from Houston to Dallasport, and um, that includes their dozer and other equipment. And so some of the chiefs on the West End are like a little nervous. Why'd you take all of your toys away? And now it's gonna be a farther response to get to, you know, it was right across the street from the Houston fire station. Well, no, are, they, not, are they completely so, out of Houston then? Uh, I'm not sure, but I know they are operating out of the Dallas. Okay, That's they what are. their lead told us at last month's meeting. Yeah. But yeah, they, they have fewer crews uh, in county this year than they've had uh, in years past. They are trying to fill those gaps by having their um, strike teams that go on in and out of service ro do a rotation through our county as well. So everybody's doing everything well, they let's, can. Let's just be hopeful. Yep, it'll all be for, we won't need any of it. Exactly. There's a lot of money to be made in fires. Uh, but there's uh, uh, easy now. I'm just, I'm watching the calendar. Let's yeah. keep, keep going, keep going. Every day is one day less. And historically speaking, yes, our, our most significant wildfires happen uh, actually in the last week of August, the first week of September. September. Yep. Exactly. All right, sir. Any questions? Nope. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Do you have anything else for the good of the order? No, I think I'm, I'm good for breaking. If you're yeah. ready for a motion. Yeah, I've got a Mr. Motion. Chair, I would make a motion to uh, uh, recess the meeting for lunch break back at one o'clock. I will step down and second the motion. All those in favor of recess, say aye. 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 Motion carries. We being that it is one o'clock, we are going to call the regular business meeting of the Klickitat County Board of County Commissioners to order. Um, let the record show Commissioners uh, Sauter and Anderson are present and Christ Commissioner Christopher is absent. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion to approve the business agenda with one add-on under unfinished business. 
This is agreement between Klickitat County Public Health Department and Chris. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chris Devil Nueva uh, for the purpose of providing expertise and technical guidance and uh, uh, on community based behavioral health services in Klickitat County. Uh, I will step down and second the motion. Uh, all those in favor with adoption of the agenda with one add on uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. And are we good? I was good with the July 26 minutes. Oh. Okay. Well, I was not here, so I don't feel comfortable. Okay. Well, I'm we, sure they're fine, but I already sent in my changes. Um, but we will we will defer until Commissioner Christopher returns. Okay, next up we are going to enter into citizen comment. Comments will be limited to three minutes per individual. Um, the commissioners will respond at such time as all of the uh, public comments have been heard. Um, and we will begin as always in the room if anybody has public comment. Seeing none, we will go online. Uh, if anybody has public comment, uh, please press star six to unmute your phone, raise your hand, turn on your microphone or your video and get our attention. And we'd love to hear from you. Zero, zero, eight, eight. Yeah, this is Delmer Eldred, Goldendale. Uh, and taxing these industrial complexes like it's farmland is just subsidizing these green energy companies. And there's a time coming that the tax gap will have to be dealt with, and that will be at the expense of the taxpayers. It's bad enough that you didn't take care of business and limiting the negative impact early on, and then you neglected to work on changing the zoning to what it should be for these energy industrial complexes. The mess that you have created for the future is unconscionable. If you would have paid more attention to the damaging effect of these energy projects or went to cease 2020 and got educated, possibly there would be there wouldn't be such a dark cloud hanging over the future of Quick Attack County. And greater yet is the tragedy of this renewable energy is that 80% of the natural resources needed come from China. And the money that is sent to China for these uh, natural materials and that are needed for the manufacturing of these solar panels are used to enrich the Communist Chinese Party. So it's uh, a pretty negative all around deal, uh, even working with these companies, but it doesn't seem to uh, bother you commissioners at all. I mean, you're perfectly satisfied with dealing dealing with these companies and feel like you've accomplished something, which is a sad uh, deal for the citizens of Click Attack County. That's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Eldred. Next, we'll go back in the room. Anybody would like to provide public comment? Okay, back online. Star six, to unmute yourself if you're on your phone. Raise your hand, turn your video on. All right, I'm not seeing anyone. I'll get some. Thank you. Oh, oh, Sherry. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I would like to talk about under canvas and the fact that this is still an appeal with the citizens <clears throat> appealing the decisions that our county has made to let under canvas have a conditional use permit in order to build and forest resource lands off a road that cannot handle that amount of traffic, which has been proven through the hearing, um, hearings, court cases. And I'd like to remind the citizens listening today 
the taxpayers. You are currently paying our county staff, our county uh, legal system to fight against the people out here on the west side against a death trap due to its location and the use of a conditional use permit to push this onto the people. So I feel that is a waste of our taxpayers' money. You, the county, the planning department knew well before this was proposed and the application hit your desk that the citizens would fight against it. You know, before any of these solar proposals, applications, you, in fact, you have a proposal from Carringer right now that you know about that you refuse to talk about that sided off night road and you plan to use a conditional use permit on this. And you know that the citizens of Goldendale are fighting against placing industrial solar complexes around the city of Goldendale and using valuable farmland. So with that, I say that it's a waste of taxpayers money to continue to go against the citizens on using a conditional use permit to put, put projects development that hurt people in the area. And that affects every single citizen in Click Attack County. You too can be affected by a corrupt conditional use permit. The under canvas is laden, laden with bad situations due to the placement. In fact, it cannot have an evacuation plan because of the road, which brings me to the fact that Oak Ridge Road, where this plans to be sited, has now been put on the six year road plan list. And that will make the citizens, the taxpayers pay to upgrade a road that is perfectly fine for its 40 houses at this time and not a small city. And I would like to also say there will, I am, I would like an explanation here. Here's a question. I'd like an explanation on the taxing. In fact, I guess you can't answer this, but I'm concerned with under canvas taking down their canvas sides off their platform that is a full functioning single unit living residence of a toilet and showers, but they take down the canvas sides, sides and then they will not pay 95 individual living units taxes. That's irresponsible and bad deals to big corporations that hurt the citizens. We make up the difference. We pay the road costs. And you're doing this with, in, with industrial renewable energy. You're hurting the citizens. Make better deals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bosquet. We will go back in the room if anybody has public comment. Please come forward. says it's on green. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I'm here to talk about a topic that's on everybody's mind today, and that's manure. Uh, at our Farm Bureau meeting last night, <clears throat> we were discussing rulemaking changes that the State Department of Health hopes to make, which will further restrict what are often called concentrated animal feeding operations, a CAFO. When we think of CAFOs, usually we would think about dairies or stockyards. Um, but the State Board of Health, it appears, is taking, uh, I won't say taking from ecology, um, coming alongside ecology to make rules which potentially would be more restrictive, such that it could affect property owners even down to five acres. Now, that sounds alarmist, and I'm not trying to be. However, that rule in front of you is simply the rule, and it's the, I gave you that because it was the easiest thing I could find. Um, regarding the Board of Health's wax and keeping of animals. Um, I left something with uh, Secretary Snell from the Department of Health that's a little bit more in depth, but I just would encourage you to comment. There, there's a comment period open now until August 17th. That is one week from tomorrow. Uh, let me back up. I would encourage you to further investigate and you may be able to talk to the county's health officer. She may have interest uh, knowledge of it, although I don't know. But 
Um, in the past, uh, dairies and stockyards and anybody who had a confined operation where they confined animals where manure could accumulate uh, had to have a plan or they do have to have a plan. But the, the rulemaking is, I think, expanding at this point where it's going to affect a lot of people. Um, Yakima County, I don't have data for Klickitat County, Yakima County has 9,000 five acre parcels. So um, I can't imagine that Click Attack County doesn't have somewhere in the hundreds or 1,000. They are not saying they're gonna go down to the five acre parcel and impose restrictions on people, but we can't tell what they're gonna do right now. Uh, the typical what's happened happens presently, if Department of Ecology finds that somebody has a nutrient, what we call a nutrient management problem, they usually address it through the local conservation district and the local conservation district works on a plan with the farmer to kind of mitigate whatever the problem is where, where the manure is affecting surface water. Um, <clears throat> I think that this new rulemaking would take the conservation districts out of it. And that concerns me greatly because the relationships that the conservation districts have with landowners, farmers, ranchers, et cetera, is important. And it's a relationship-based success. Um, it's not a matter of enforcement. And enforcement always makes everybody's blood pressure goes up go up so i would encourage you to investigate it further as you have time consider commenting if you find it appropriate their 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 date is august 17th for closure of comments thank you thank you mr barda <clears throat> okay back online anybody who would like to provide public comment R6, raise your hand, turn your video on. 7211. Greg Wagner with C. From 2006 to 2013, the wind facilities were appraised using the income based method. This method ensured a steady tax revenue to the county. In 2011, the citizens of Bickleton approved a $8.9 million bond to build their school. They approved that bond based on the large sums of revenue received from the wind tax. In 2013, Assessor Darlene Johnson changed the appraisal method to cost. In doing so, the corporation started receiving an annual 8.5% depreciation on their personal property. And each year forward, the county received less revenue. When this change occurred, it gave the wind corporations a tax break and became a tax burden to the already overburdened Bickleton citizens. Those citizens are now paying additional taxes, taxes not paid by the wind corporation. On May 20th, 2021, Assessor Krista Schroeder confirmed this, stating their levy rates double. Krista Schroeder also stated, I can change the appraisal method. Her statement has been confirmed by Lisa Brewer and Corey Gunnerson, valuation specialist with the Department of Revenue. The assessor, they stated that the assessor can use one or any combination of appraisal methods. No one method is mandated. Trista never stated she needed approval from the Department of Revenue as the commissioners continued to claim. The commissioners claim assessing and collecting collection of taxes is not your job. But RCW 3632-120 powers of a leg legislative authority states, number four, fix the amount of county taxes to be assessed according to the provisions of law and cause the same to be collected as prescribed by law. Five, allow all accounts legally chargeable against the county not otherwise provided for and audit the accounts of all officers having the care, management, collection, or disbursement of any monies belonging to the county are appropriated to its benefit. It is, your, it is your job and time to start doing it. Citizens, continue, citizens taxes continue to increase while wind taxes decrease. Will this be the same for all future solar sites? At this time, the answer is yes. You knew about this and didn't take the appropriate action to correct it. It's been nine years of depreciating revenue from the wind facility, a large sum of tax revenue loss which becomes an additional burden to all the citizens of the county. It's time to stop giving wind and future solar tax breaks and all their special favors. 
time to start placing the needs of the citizens first. Citizens, you are paid to represent. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. All right, back in the room. Just come forward. About maybe 20 years ago, or not quite that long, I used to be in here almost every week with different people talking to the commissioners at that time, Don Strzok, Ray Sayer, Joan Fry. We had lots of good conversations, lots of not good conversations. Sometimes they listened, sometimes they didn't. We lost more than we ever won, but we kept at it. The problem was with them as, as it is now, lots of time they speak, and I don't know what sticks in the brain when you hear it. At one time, I give them each one ear, ear plug, and they said, well, what's only one, Ron? I said, I'm hoping what goes in the other side will bounce around and maybe stick there for a while. I have I brought some today for you. I go give them to you, but I don't I, it's the emphasis I'm trying to put on. Lots of times I hear good stuff come to you folks, and I don't hear the good answers. They the citizens got to win once in a while. That's part of their if, if they're if they're participating in the whole process. The fact that they come in here, they, they have a thought, you know, I believe what happens, lots of times it just goes away before I even get out of here. So I just, I'm just going to pass that along. In fact, Joan Fry just realized, I seen her not long ago, and she walked up to me and said, Ron, I still got that beer plug. And I also give them a cry and tell one time in, the, in our career there, and they still laugh about it. But I, uh, the emphasis I have is, listen sometimes and give an answer you know i i don't i don't come here all the time anymore i don't I don't want to but i don't when i walk away from here i'm not sure you really think anywhere along the lines i even talk that's because you're on you're on your own uh, mission i guess so but it's important i just heard uh, wagner call i heard don uh, elred or dell and, and, and dell comes up with good stuff cease comes up with good stuff I don't see a lots of response to it. Once in a while, they got to say something right. I would think out of all their knowledge, and they're not dummies, Sherry, none of those people are dummies. They're trying to get across a point, but they don't ever get any good answer to their points. Some of them they, they, they should be given credit for, I'm sure about that, but you won't do it because you want to do it only your way. Anyway, I won't waste any more of your time. And I thank you for before you leave, Mr. Chair, can I respond, please? Yeah, because I, I want to have this conversation. You you reference several of these things yeah. where are the are these are these, you know, that there are some good ideas that right. come. I completely agree. But I also know that especially some folks, they have a certain point of view and we cannot seem to get to any kind of common ground. And there are you know, you, you speak about, you know, I've written down the notes so that I can respond. You know, Miss Bosquet's comment about, again, this sounds really good about this, the, you're spending money, that, you know, the citizens are having to appeal, the counties, it's like, actually, that's not accurate. Those individuals are appealing a superior court's decision, not the county's decision. That's what's being appealed right now. Prior to that, it was the hearings examiner right. decision that was appealed. They just didn't like the outcome of it. And so they have every right to appeal that decision. That's not on us necessarily. It makes it sounds like a good sound bite, but that's not actually the truth. The same thing with the six year road plan that now suddenly Oak Ridge Road and they're trying to make it sound like because of under canvas. Now it got put on to the six. That project has been on the six year road program for like 12 years, long before under canvas was even thinking about building a thing there. So again, that's my response. Those allegations have been made multiple times and we've answered them. I've answered them before and it doesn't seem to be, it's like people need to listen back and forth. I don't think much is bouncing around the other way either. 
So that's so it does make it really hard for me once I have tried and tried and tried. I do kind of give up. You shouldn't give up. There should be conversations back and forth until you can come up with something. Maybe you maybe not get the total plan or maybe not get everything to one side or the other. Right. But some give somewhere if you talk about it more. I know I, I, with the commissioners I used to work with in those days, we did have some pretty hot discussion. We didn't have quite the same routine that you guys have, but we would have some pretty good hot conversation. And we would get a little bit, like I, I said, we won some, But didn't we you, some. once the conversation was over and that you had gotten, you know, that you didn't come back the next week and have the same conversation again, right. and then the next week and have the same conversation again, and the next week and have the same conversation again? Well, I, it's, a, it's a matter of there's not a lot of trust. There's not a lot right. of trust between the, the, the citizens and you folks. I disagree with In that. I think there is not a lot of trust between certain citizens and us. I'm not saying all citizens. I'm no, I'm not saying most citizens. I don't think you can undermine, um, although people, we have basically the last two years, it has been a basically character assassination for the last two years. And uh, even with that, I still talk to lots and lots and lots of people. And the vast majority of them, I am not getting, um, it is, um, I would say your statement is not accurate. I would say, yes, yeah, some people based on, you know, they have, you know, if you, we learn over time, if you keep saying the same thing, even if it's wrong over and over and over again, some people start to listen to that. But other folks that have a little more history and understand, they, they stopped listening a long time ago. The point of it is, in my, my perspective, I, I hear lots of stuff outside, mm -hmm from those people or other people that I know. The problem is, 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 is the participation from the citizens. I know lots of citizens don't like what they hear, but they don't speak out. They don't come and participate. That was the number one thing years ago when I was, we had a political action committee. We strive to get people. We strive to get lots of people. I used to tell people to show up at the commissioner's meeting with a toothpaste dribbling down their chins like they were having a frenzy or something, you know, <laughs> to, to deal with them. It was a joke. But you could, I could deal with those folks that way. And we didn't win them all. We fought lots of them. We won once in a while, lose most of the time. In fact, my friend and I that both retired here, one day he said, Ron, you retired here. And he said, I did too. I'm quitting this stuff after four years. But we did some good in four years. These people have to do some good too. The ones that are participating now, I know a lot of talk. I talk to them a lot of times, and they have smart brains, and they do a lot of checking into this and checking into that. And they they just don't throw it out because they're dumb. They throw it out because they're smart, and they're hoping that some of it will stick with you guys. I could give you these now, or you don't need them, or you wouldn't use them anyway. Anyway, I gotta go after that. Thank you very much, at least you talking Kinsella. back to me today. I appreciate that. So, Ron, we yeah. do have, so you just noticed, we just used 10 minutes on this back and forth, yeah. which is three more people who did not get a chance to speak. I'm and sorry that is for the, them. And that I'm is a reason why we have this the way it is, so that we can hear from, from the public and we can get into that discussion. Now, I'll always take earplugs because I have a sawmill and a chainsaw and everything else. Uh, on top of that, though, many times, Ron, you've came in and said your piece, yeah. and then you get up and yeah. you walk out the door. Yeah. When you walk out the door, you're not here to listen to what we have to say in response. Okay. That's because I expect it to be responded to just like I just got. That was a good, to me, that fulfilled my need for what I was doing. I know it took more time. That's what I was surprised you give me that much time, but that I appreciate it when you talk about it. Even if I don't like it, at least... And if it, so, after you get done with your three minute convert comment, if you sit back down and wait, Until you next, will hear yeah, yeah. a response by the end of that conversation. Next, okay, I just don't agree with that process. That's well, basically. that was instituted for a reason, Ron. Yeah, I know what you said. I know exactly what you're telling me, but he just did it, and I just talked back, and it worked. I feel better about the answers I get when I get the answers, so I don't have to wait around till 30 more minutes or whatever time frame. I appreciate it. I may be back again, maybe with a towel next time. You can leave the toothpaste at home. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, yeah, that went out a long time ago. But uh, Ernie, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Your Consul. Time. Is there anybody else who would like to provide public comment? This is your last chance, either in the room or on the phone. Star six to unmute yourself, raise your hand, turn your video on. Okay. Excuse me, Commissioner Anderson. I would like to clarify to Commissioner Sauter that what the, the citizens are appealing is the planning director's SEPA decision for a mitigated determination of non-significance. And that is the decision made by the county planning director that the citizens appealed. That was our first initial appeal. That is a county entity, and that is the county decision that the citizens appealed. So I just wanted to clarify that that is what we initially appealed is a county decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bosque. Commissioner Sauter, would you like to respond to anything you've heard during public comment? A um, couple things. Um, Mr. Eldred, you talk about the tra uh, tax structure. I would, I would invite you, again, you're not saying anything that we have not been saying as far as I was aware when the um, income method, when, when then Assessor Johnston changed that, that there was going to be impacts from that. Um, but that's the assessor's decision as far as the valuation. So I'm not really sure, um, but I would invite um, the assessor, I think is in today at 1, 140, so coming right up, to have a discussion about the taxing, how the system, the taxation system works on, um, on these large renewable projects. And that's, um, I agree, we need to understand that, but I also need to reinforce, contrary to Mr. Wagner is quoting the RCW that it, yes, we do the assessments, we don't, I can't reach in as a county commissioner and decide that whoever it is, if whether it's a school district, a fire district, that I don't like their levy rate or what they're levying and change it. That is not authority that we have. We have, we're the final say, we have to sign off because we do, we're the ones, it's our authority that we're levying, levying the taxes. We're the final um, ones that sign off on that, but we don't have any, um, yeah, I'd love to go back to a school district and tell them, you know that levy you're do, you, your voters approved? Yeah, I think it's too much. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just change that. Yeah, no, I don't have, you're, you're assuming authority that the board does not have. Um, I would be curious too as to, um, and you can answer next week, Mr. Wagner, as far as your statement about you knew and you did not take appropriate action. I would like to know what you think, what was the appropriate action that the board was supposed to take in 2013 when then Assessor Johnston uh, changed the taxation system. Uh, and I'm gonna stop there. Well, you, you hit on most of the ones I was thinking about. Um, in terms of uh, Mr. Eldred, where a company buys its solar panels or any of its products from, we have no control over that. That is not within our purview. That is not something that we would like to have control over because we firmly believe in people's rights to buy whatever they want, wherever they want. Free market. It is a free market society. Um, and whether it enriches the Communist Chinese Party or not, um, we have no say in that. Um, as, as I've always said, people like to think we're God, but we're definitely not. Uh, Mrs. Bosquet, in terms of forest resource lands, I think you mean um, the resource land zoning designation, not forest resource lands. I don't think we have any forest resource lands within the Houston BZ sub area. Um, as to, um, the fight against people death trap against its location, that is not something that we look at, that is something that the fire departments look at. All of these things I would believe have been mitigated in, in that SEPA determination of mitigation. 
whether you agree with them on what the fire chief or anyone else says or not, that is between you and them. And as Commissioner uh, Sauter mentioned, it is always your right to appeal a decision if you do not feel that that is correct. That is enshrined in our laws. That is a part of the process. Making statements and accusations that the people are having to fight their own government um, and, pay, and spend their own money, that is a part of the process. In fact, if we were to sit up here and say, Miss Bosquet, we don't like that you're planning or want to build something on your property, um, and we're telling you no, you would be fighting us that same exact way because we all want to be able to do what we want on our property. Um, there is a process in which you have to go through. What you've asked for continually over and over and over again, if we were to implement that, that would be taking people's rights away from them before they have an, uh, the ability to apply for the right to do something on their property. Um, I just hope that you can see things from both sides. As to Mr. Barda, um, I believe we have lost our health officer, but what I can say is, is having served on the um, state boards as well as the conservation district, I 100% understand how this is changing. CAFOs used to be for large confined area feeding operations, and now we have CAFO permits for uh, two person or two cow dairies in Trout Lake. Um, and whether it's on five acres or 10 acres or 20 acres, I see this steamrolling com coming for all agriculture. And I know how long it takes to write one of those confined area feeding operation plans. And yes, I'm very concerned. And when people say that we don't listen, when somebody comes up here and provides us the information and does it in a kind and courteous manner, we're far more likely to spend our limited amount of time actually looking into it so that we can write letters of support. And when you have an ask that is reasonable and responsible, whether it's supporting something or not supporting something, we do look into it and we write letters of support all of the time for things. Um, so thank you for bringing this forward to Mr. Mr. Barta. I had not seen this new updated WAC. And as for Mr. Wagner, um, there is the RCW, um, but then whenever you look at an RCW, you should also look at the WACs like Mr. Barta prepared for us because there's what the legislature intends and then there's what the government creates rules about and how it's going to implement those. And those things need to be taken together on how we are stuck implementing codes and policies and everything from the state. With regards to your statement, the powers of the legislative authority, which is to fix the amount of county taxes to be assessed. What that means is, is that we create the budget process that we're just starting and we come up with a budget of what it, how much money it's gonna take in order to do our job. And then we get to fix that assessed value um, or not the assessed value, that, that amount of money. It is then usually what we end up having to do is we live within our means because we can only raise 1% more money per year, plus you know new construction and everything else, which we're about to hear from the assessor on. So I'm not gonna speak any more to that. But in regards to Mr. Kinsella, when you say we don't listen, we don't pay any attention, we don't do anything, I agree. Uh, many of these people have really good ideas. Um, and we have implemented those ideas. We are changing the way that we assess fees in this county. Now everyone is going to be paying for the time that they spend, whether it's uh, processing your conditional use permit application, whether it is your building permit, fees are going up in response. Uh, you said that, it, that, um, that we do not charge staff time. Well, we are charging staff time, so you are gonna get exactly what you want. It's just everybody has to be equal and everybody is going to be getting charged staff time. Uh, there's a base fee, but once you go over that normal number of hours that it takes, everyone will be charged. So um, the public can definitely thank you, Mr. Wagner, um, for bringing this forward and we have remedied the situation. Um, let's see if there was anybody else. I think I have gone over time. So with that, I would like to say thank you for everyone uh, who provided public comment today for the back and forth Anderson. with Mr. Kinsella. Um, we are going to close public comment because we are just a little bit behind now and we're already following, but falling behind. 
I'm sorry, public comment is closed. You are welcome to comment next Tuesday at one o'clock. If you have something that you would love to say, you're more than welcome to email me or call me, Jacob A at clickattackcounty.org. Moving forward, we are going to move into uh, the public meeting to consider the approval of short plat SPL 2021-28. Applicants are Jim and Patricia. Okay, SPL 2021-28 is a proposal to create three lots from parcel 0416-3207-750300. In that Goldendale vicinity off of Wayne Road. The admin review of this short plat has been completed. Signatures have been obtained from the Road Health Planning and Treasurer's Office. All conditions of preliminary approval have been met. If the board finds it's in the public's interest to approve this short plat, a motion needs to be made granting final approval of SPL 2021-28 applicants, Jim and Patricia Ferrer. Do you have any? No, really straightforward. I mean, it's as straightforward as straightforward gets. Three rectangles <laughs> out of a bigger <laughs> rectangle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion uh, to grant final approval to SPL 2021-20. The applicants are uh, Jim and Patricia Ferrer. I will step down and second the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. All right. While we're working on signing this, uh, Casey? The uh, juvenile court administrator is unable to join me today. Um, but he received a resignation from his office manager, and so he is seeking verbal to post for his office manager position. Steps one through three, it's a current position within his budget, all that good stuff. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, elected official report, Assessor Krista Schroeder. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. How are you guys today? Great. Great. <laughs> Looking for an education. Yeah. Okay. Enlighten me. So um, with me today is Chief Appraiser Billy Bear and your next assessor, by the way. Um, I did wanted to clarify one thing on the um, on your agenda. It stated that the I'd be talking about um, property taxes levied for collection for the 2024, and we will actually be assessing solar this year for collection next year, um, as well as the ongoing uh, wind facilities. So. Um, we're before you today once again to explain the valuation of wind and solar facilities. We are happy to be here to address the facts and to dispute the misinformation that's been um, discussed in the public repeatedly. Um, our office is required to follow Washington State RCWs and WACs when assessing property. WAC 458 070030 states that all property must be valued and assessed at 100% of true and fair value unless otherwise provided by law. WAC 458070302 goes on to state in determining true and fair value or highest and best use, the assessor may use a sales approach, which is the market approach, a cost approach, or an income approach, or a combination of the three. The cost and income approaches shall be dominant factors. Dominant factors in considering and determining true and fair value in cases of property of a complex nature or property not having a record of sale within five years and not having a significant number of sales of comparable property in our general area. In determining which approach to utilize to value a parcel, we ask ourselves, is the approach systematic, uniform, logical, consistent, and is the data we need readily available? WAG 458-070-0304, in valuing a lot, tract, or parcel of real property, we must determine the true and fair value of the land, excluding the structures or growing crops. 
The assessor must also determine the true and fair value of any structure on the land. The total value of the land and structures cannot exceed 100% of the true and fair value of the total property as it exists at the time of appraisal. So <laughs> um, taking into account what I just explained, if parcels have a change in use, say from farming to a lease for solar, we may change the approach to value. There are certain steps that we take when we do that. We determine the major contributors to value. We request and collect the data and we analyze the, data, the data and determine an approach to value. To collect the data for the properties that were in farm and egg and are no longer in farm and egg, we requested data from the solar companies and the landowners. We discussed um, the process with appraisal experts and are ongoing discussing it with the Department of Revenue. We want to be sure that we're within the recommended guidelines and appraisal standards. One thing that we have to remember is all assessments have to be equitable and uniform for that type of property. The value, um, we value the majority of the parcels in our county by a sales approach. However, we do have a few that are income or cost approach uh, values. <clears throat> um, there seems to be confusion um, in the difference between assessing the land beneath a solar facility versus assessing the facility itself. Um, both, both approaches are very clear. They've been in the laws um, since prior to, what is it, like 2011, prior to 2011. Um, so that brings us to personal property. Personal property is generally valued using the cost approach. The acquisition cost includes freight, trade-in allowance, installation, and any fees incurred to get the machinery operational. Original cost new less depreciation is a basis for valuation of personal property as the information is easily obtainable and this method lends itself to readily to computerized mass appraisal format and with trend and depreciation tables easily updated. In fact, RCW 8440-4203 specifically states county assessors must refer to this guidance, including cost-based appraisal methods and industry specific valuation tables when valuing renewable property, renewable energy property. The legislature had proposals before them this year to change the way um, wind and solar would be assessed. And that outcome changed that RCW a little bit in that it required the Department of Revenue to work with stakeholders on um, reviewing the trend, which is the depreciation schedule that it's on, but it still leaves the cost-based based method as the current recommended methodology for assessing wind and solar. Um, they update the personal industrial property valuation guidelines every year. Every year they review certain industries to be sure that the trend table is accurate for the equipment as it as it current as its lifespan currently is. The guidelines are based on the typical physical depreciation and functional obsolescence for assets that have been maintained in average condition. The percent good table estimates a percentage of remaining value of the asset. Um, there have been a lot of questions on why solar and wind facilities are picked up as personal property and under the cost approach with the depreciation. Um, and WAC 458.12.005, Section 2I, defines personal property as machinery or equipment of any commercial or industrial business which operates on leased land or rented quarters. Such machinery or equipment is a trade fixture, i.e. the tenant's personal property, no matter how firmly it may be attached to the landlord's realty. <clears throat> I... Um, I have been in conversation with Lisa Brewer specifically. She has reviewed the information that's been submitted by Lund Hill for assessment purposes, and she agrees with currently carrying on with the way wind facilities have been assessed since Darlene changed the assessment based on the recommended methodology of the Department of Revenue. Prior to that, there was no 
recommended methodology from the Department of Revenue. Um, if I may, Mr. Chair, can you, uh, Lisa Brewer, can you tell me who is that? So she is one of the personal property um, appraisers. She is the one that- With Department of Revenue. Yes, with the Thank Department you. of Revenue, sorry. Um, she is the one who audits our wind facilities. Every year they randomly choose a wind facility to audit. We have been in the high 90% um, of assessed value in every audit since I've been in office. Um, usually like 96, 98%. That means we're, you know, as close to 100% that you can be with, you know, I'm human, over. with human <laughs> error, correct. Um, I would assume that they would carry on and start randomly selecting solar facilities to audit as well. So even though the RCW states that I could um, choose a different method, it also states that there has to be um, compelling reason to do so. Thank you. Yes. Um, what's the definition of a compelling reason? Is it two screaming members of the public? I don't know. Um, you know that you did propose legislature to change the way. So as commissioners, you all have been active in the appropriate process to change the way something is being assessed, which is to go to your legislatures and um, propose something different. Um, the other thing that I would like to state is all structures within our county, so structures, we're talking about houses, buildings, um, barns, sheds, garages, um, any of that kind of stuff, they are all assessed and are also depreciated based on the tables in our assessment software. So, you know, once again, we have many things that we assess that depreciate. The difference is that we then, um, we can apply a market factor Right, based off of market conditions. Yes. So kind of out, or it is another balancing act with the assessed values. Correct. Um, I think that pretty much covers, um, you know, the basis of the assessments. There's also um, been some misinformation about um, how much taxes the wind facilities have paid. I don't get into taxes necessarily. I leave that to Greg. However, for 2022 tax year, the wind facilities, less the state assessed facilities, were valued at $602,676,789. That does not include their secondary personal property listings um, if they're if they're holding like all their office furniture and all that kind of stuff in a in a um, a different a different name, but six hundred two million dollars is significant amount of of taxes, especially in a county that um, you know we're assessed at over four billion dollars um, for twenty twenty two tax year. I guess that leaves us open for any questions you may have. So the depreciation schedule um say a solar facilities life span according to them might be 20 years or 25 years do you depreciate it then on that 25 year schedule based on how long they say that is going to last it's not what they say it's what the department of revenue they have the industrial valuation guidelines every year and that has the trend table for everything that people report it's like 20 or 30 pages mm -hmm. long and it gives you, um, you know, a list of the different equipment and, and its lifespan, and it'll depreciate down to a 15% good, and then that's where it'll stay. So the other thing that both wind and facility and any other um, commercial business, whether it's farmers or McDonald's or gas stations or whatever it is, is when they replace an item or if they refurbish an item, they then add that to their personal property listing and that'll increase their value. Typically, personal property does not get a new construction bump. We've talked about this, um, but wind, solar, and biomass has been um, taken out of the personal property, no new construction list, and added, you know, legislature specifically to be able to increase taxing districts' budgets by the dollar amount of new construction for those facilities. 
that increase in taxing districts budgets is what creates the the eventual shift of taxes to you know every other landowner and it also in, it increases everybody's levy rate because real property can't keep up with depre depreciating property so knowing that that tax shift is there mm -hmm. if wind and solar were taxed on the income based method wouldn't that flatten that curve and would that then still would that would that eliminate the tax shift <laughs> when you get into would it what ifs i mean it's hard to say i have not sat down and ran the numbers to determine and i won't state anything that i don't know for a fact um i mean it, it it seems reasonable that it wouldn't have that. But it's also going to depend upon do, are they still getting new construction bumps because it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how you're valuing it. It doesn't matter if you value it cost or income or whatever if that initial value that goes on there, you know, gets added into their budgets, it's still going to eventually be some type of offset, I believe. So, right. So <laughs> if you, you if you use the income based method but you didn't have the tax bump, you know, if it didn't get added to new, so it didn't depreciate down. Instead, you were just valuing it and not putting on as new construction. You're just they're paying according to that. Would that then eliminate that? As long as their income would continue stable to increasing, it seems reasonable that it would. Mm -hmm. And and so isn't that the reason why we use the income based method under Van? No, Van used the a modified income based method because at that time there was no other method right. known in Washington state. Right. And and it was a modified it was a very low value if if you and I should have brought those numbers. Um, if you look at the value that um, van had on wind facilities and then you look at the first year that Darlene put them on as um, <clears throat> the cost based. Van's values were significantly lower than even though the first year Darling put them on, they were still depreciated based on the initial um, implementation year. Right. So when I talked to Van way back then, it was, you know, he said it so that it would we would we would retain a certain amount of money coming in over a long period of time at the same level, thus not having to worry about the declining on you know the valuation and that was why he said it kind of at a midpoint it's the right. same discussions we've had at the right at the state you know yes. trying to find a midpoint right whereas then when darlene came on board any new wind construction you start at full market value and it slowly depreciates down and after five years or whatever you're you finally you've hit van's point you know what he was getting and then it went down from there and as it went down everybody else has had to come up so as an assessor van did the best that he thought he could at the time he talked to the facilities he talked to other assessors he talked to the department of revenue there was no known methodology at that mm -hmm. time since then the department of revenue came up with a recommended methodology and darlene changed it to that I, I'm not saying any method is better than the other method I'm just saying that this is the recommended methodology and for uniformity and assessments, that's the way I've continued to do it. My thing is propose legislature to change it. Um, you know, if you look at the income approach and you don't get a new construction bump, that's not going to help the taxing districts either, which that was also one of the um, entities that were in the discussion with Van when he when he set the values as he did. So on the income based approach, it doesn't help any of the junior taxing districts? Not if they don't get a new construction bump. So so then with the, the with the businesses that are on the income based method currently. They do do new construction if it's um, real property, yes. Oh, so there is a, a real property bump. Yeah. yeah. Anytime you increase the value on real property, not anytime, I should be careful about that. <laughs> When when you when you add value that um, qualifies as a new construction value, 
it, it can increase the district's budget amount if they choose to take it. Mm -hmm. Like the Bickleton School District. Yes, exactly like the Bickleton School District. So I'm just, I know everybody's listening. So as I'm trying to understand this, when Wynn hit way back when and the Bickleton School District, and we, we were on the income hybrid income method, and the school district said, you know, we've got all these millions of dollars of new valuation and we want to raise X number of dollars. Mm -hmm. And a good portion of that is going to be paid by the wind companies because they're on this flat rate and we know how what percentage they're going to pay and what percentage the public's going to pay. Once that gets shifted to the cost base method and it depreciates down, then every year as it depreciates past that centroid point, all of the rest Increase of the, the levy people rates, yes. have the levy yes. rates have to go up. Right? Yes. But in that instance, though, because of the way it was being assessed with the income based method, if it would have stayed there, then that percentage of who pays what would have stayed about the same, correct? Probably. There, there, the, the problem is there's so many variables when you start doing the levy process. Um, but yeah, if you have a stable assessed value, regardless of how that's achieved, you will have a more stable levy rate, depending upon the levy process factors, yes. And, and maybe some folks that are maybe a little more familiar, because I was involved with um, some other stuff out in Bickleton when that was going on, as far as they had, you know, they were two or three years into their um, bond Mm -hmm. for the new school, which as I recall, and, and I don't, that their construction was they had purposefully, it was a really short, it was only 10 years yes. because they had anticipated, they only had 10 years of exactly that, it was gonna be level. And so if I'm recalling correctly, and maybe some locals on the East end here, or Central East can correct me, was that um, they kind of hurried up, you know, once things changed, because they knew that shift was taking place and they got that paid off so that it isn't. So I'm kind of curious when we had an earlier commenter about, you know, basically that the situation is like, to my knowledge at that time, and again, maybe they went out and did something different after that that I'm not aware of, was that the new school got paid off as far as the bond for that some time ago and it's not really in play today with the depreciation of there is depreciation going on because of the wind projects on their just their general school levies and their everything out there but it's not about the the bond Correct. for the new construction on the school Correct, and and the bond was was in addition to their budgetary levy rates so they actually went out for a 10-year bond for a certain amount of money right and that i mean they 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 would get that above their regular budgeted right. amount so really what changed though with the depreciation is the who was there they anticipated you know the wind farms were going to pay you know and i remember getting that kicked around at the time it was like you know 80 percent of the new school is going to get paid for from wind and the 20 percent is the regular people what well, depreciation what happened is wind didn't pay 80 percent it went down and the the regular taxpayers had to make up the difference in between the depreciation yeah. and so it didn't i mean it still was a really good deal but it was not kind of how it had been billed to the voters when they put it out there. Right, and and the problem with giving- um, But the, again, that's all in the past. Right, that is in the past. It's not, there, I'm there's not no sure current why it's, school it, bond. There's no, not for Beckleton anyway. Right. Um, and that was all, yeah. And, and they did do specifically a 10 year because that was the- Kind of the window the, that they felt yeah, was that, And that was the discussion at the time between Van and the wind facilities, the school, the districts, the DOR, and anybody else that he could pull in to try to figure out you know how to do this for the benefit of everybody. Can I so. have a ball up, sure. So back to the um, appropriate uh, action. As far as yes, we have been working. We've been trying to work with the legislature to get some at least some tools that are at least available 
locally to change how you do your job. Because mm -hmm. again, we don't have this. You're correct. You're, you cannot tell me. How I can't to tell assess you that. anything. That is your <laughs> job that the people gave you, and I don't want to even talk about that. Just like I can't tell you how to do your job. Exactly, and I would push back if you did. <laughs> Um, but as far as the one thing that we did get was they're at least looking at that committee to look at those depreciation tables. When are, are we expecting maybe, because frankly to me, the eight and a half percent doesn't seem, I know that's kind of industry standard, but I'm wondering if maybe they'll come back with a recommendation that when you run that depreciation schedule, these projects are not at 15% of their value when they're depreciated out in that period of time, that maybe they'll change that. That would give us some, um, or do you have no, again, I'm asking you to look at the tea leaves in your professional opinion. <laughs> if I could figure opinion. out what the Department of Revenue was going to tell me, I would tell you already that, hey, this is the way it looks like it's going to go, but I have no idea. Um, I mean, have they modified those, you say they change them every year. Mm -hmm. For, for different facilities when they review them, yes. Right. Or so there's at least there's equipment. at least there's the the process should work if they look at it and they it looks like yeah, yeah maybe there's some there's some validity to that this depreciation schedule is really not the trending is not it's too steep for the industry that they could make change the recommendation. I mean, they always could. That I mean, they do it every year on different equipment. So that I mean, that is a possibility, and they are reviewing it. So. Um, we got that. The pro yes. <laughs> so I'm sorry. It's just I have no idea. Um, you know, I've been screaming and hollering from the rafters that, you know, we're going to have a, an, an online facility this year. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's not a lot of assistance out there uh, when you need it. But but, you know, Lisa Brewer from the Department of Revenue has reviewed the information that was submitted by Lund Hill. They agree with you know how it's submitted. They agree with the the process that we will be doing um, with the facility. Um, so I don't know um, you know what conversations the members of the public have had with Lisa, um, but I know that we are on target for statutorily and recommendation wise on doing what we should be doing. Okay, one one more please. Just because I want to make sure, because I and I'm just kind of responding from what comments I've heard over the last several months. Mm -hmm. So on energy projects, solar being different than wind in that the underlying property, if it's if it's if it's pre-zoning or pre was in farm and ranch, so it was an ag zoning. Yeah, it's not a zoning. It's okay. Yeah, use. I know. No, I know. I'm sorry. I hear. Come I hear. On, I hear Mochi's running down here right now, <laughs> and you know as well, and I know better. Right. The um, <laughs> so if it's if it's tax designation yes. is agriculture, and wind projects historically, when the projects were placed on them, other than the land, you know, that was really specifically that stayed. The rest, the balance of the property stayed in ag because agricultural, the use was still continuing and it could still qualify. Solar is, I'm curious, I mean, my understanding, and again, this is just from what I've gleaned from our conversations, is that that is that these projects, if the they come out of the agricultural tax, because it's very difficult for the agricultural use to still qualify. Is that true? Is that accurate? Yes, in our so there is no tax ag tax break to solar companies. Not in our county. So the, well, we can only speak to our county. Right. The the wind facility is different because if you look at the dirt, and I'm not talking about rolling up there and looking at the big, you know, wind um, towers. When you roll up there and you look at the dirt, the primary use of the majority of the property that has is still agriculture. It, it's still grazing cattle. It's still right. growing crops. Right. Um, the solar is different. They have um, specifically contractual agreements not to farm or, or graze uh, within the, the fence boundaries of the solar facilities. And Lund Hill, as being the only fully permitted and completed 
um, solar project within our county, those parcels that are within the fence that have panels and supportive structures have been removed from the open space farm and egg program and additional taxes tax. and interest has been paid um that's just like they would be for anybody else yeah just if like i it, stopped yeah. farming yeah i'm out i got to pay my seven years back and yeah. so so once that came off the program what is the, the, the question would be well we know what the zoning yeah is. sorry i use that zoning. what is the what is the use code now is it is it under industrial use code or? i was in the sun a lot last week so <laughs> <laughs> um, it will be utility because it's a utility right it's an electric it's electricity it's creating okay. electricity okay. so it'll be okay. a utility and it'll be assessed based on its highest and best use which is utility now, which has yes. a much higher rate per acre than, say, a houses or development. You, you or could what. assume that we're still working the numbers, right? And and so, as I understand it, in those contracts, the company will pay that difference in that taxation in a lot of those. Yeah. So, but in answer to the questions, is that it's not still going to be taxed as farm ground? It's not, and I've told everybody that's asked. I believe that, you. That, that, I believe that it you. is not, and and you know, um, people that have inquired within my office have been told specifically that that property has already been removed. It was removed last year. So, um, and so when so the next question though would be is when you remove it, and you look at the last seven years, do you remove it? At, at what it was being used for so it'd be open space or do you remove it for what it's going to be which is utility electricity so for open space under the open space act rcw 8434 parcels are removed from those programs based on the actual assessed value market value minus the current use value um and that's by statute then they also get a one percent interest per month and depending upon the removal from the program process a 20 percent penalty on the additional tax forest is the one that does the current market value oh okay designated forest rcw 8433 right so but yes everybody paid their seven years back taxes at whatever 70 percent interest on that seventh year yes but the problem with that is it's not a problem so a clarification and education of open space and forest removal fees the taxing districts already received their money so when property is in in a in a reduced assessed value program for whatever reason the districts still collect that money they they still collect their budget it's just the levy rate is going to increase because of the reduced value and that's whether it's a government property, a senior or disabled or veterans exemption, or whether it's open space or designated forest or. The other people pay the difference to me. Right, what they should. Yeah, so is. those. So the, then once it comes out and you pay all this back taxes. Yeah, where does that go? It's, does that it's go? not back taxes. Well, it's, it's not back okay, taxes. It's, it, it is additional taxes. Uh, and so because go? it goes to the taxing districts. A portion by the. Yeah, so the, like, let's say. Uh, EMS district has like a 50 cent levy. So for the parcel that would have paid 50 cents to the EMS district, the removal amount, you know, for that district is it, you, they'll get that. So in essence, it's a bonus to them because the EMS district already got the money. Mm -hmm. But once you pull that out, they're going to get additional monies they had not budgeted. And so it's kind of like a, a, a bonus bump. check. A it's, bonus a, check. it's an additional amount of money that they receive. Over what they would have ever got. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So when, when are you hoping to have that done on what that utility value is going to be on the underlying ground? Before September 14th. I was going to say before November. <laughs> We've worked diligently with the Department of Revenue and, um, like she stated before, um, expert appraisers. 
the company itself, Lundhill, um, landowners. and landowners. And we're, that's kind of the process. When we're trying to determine, we have to gather all of that data. We just don't want to just pull something out of the air. We've got to have something that will, um, like she said, be sustainable, maintainable, and uniform. uniform. Well, it needs to be, right, uniform, equitable, and it has to be defensible. Is that I like you, and so I'm going to just, oh, I'm going to pick this number, or I don't like you, and I'm going to pick this other number. Right. It has to actually be based on some sort of methodology and right. facts. Yeah, right. So Correct. so I, I know exactly what we're going to hear next week, yeah. and that is is that um, you there is a recommended methodology, but you are- For the facilities. For the, for the personal property, for the yes. facilities, right? Yes. There is a recommended methodology. Yes. And what we're going to hear, and I'm sure you're going to hear, is if that is a recommended methodology, why are you going to follow the recommended methodology when you know that it's flawed in its execution because it creates a tax shift and a tax burden to all of the regular taxpayers who don't have multi-million dollar corporations on their backs? Because what you're in essence doing is, is you're raising the construction value, so you're creating a new value on top of what the county's valuation is. And that is going to become a tax shift in a very short number of years to everyone else. Why would you, and when there is a compelling reason, I can already hear the voice in the back of my head saying, with that compelling reason, would that not be that tax shift be a compelling enough reason to use the income-based method so that you can create a method of taxation that is level, much like the rates on the their long-term contracts for their for the energy production it would that not be a more fair rational and reasonable way to do that with regards to solar and since it's your first one you'd have the ability to tax it at that thus be saying that everybody in the solar world is fair and taxed equitably in the same manner and a so it's a compelling reason to assess it differently than all other facilities on leased land that's what you're telling me because of the value because of the value of wind and solar because you can't separate out you can't say well solar is different than wind it's all renewable energy okay i mean there's some differences but it's still a utility it's still a renewable energy so we can't it would not be uniform and equitable to say well now that solar is new even though it's a renewable energy we're going to assess it this way so the compelling reason I mean, I, I personally don't see a compelling reason to assess them differently than all other commercial and industrial property in Klickitat County. The, the issue is that districts get a new construction bump, and the issue is that the value of the wind facilities is such a tremendous amount of the total value of our county. So those are issues. and and they're valid ones but i don't think that it's a compelling reason for me to change just a single um, type of industry's way of valuing compared to everything else so we've changed it before and this would be like a question for the prosecuting attorney or you know a specialized attorney say there's a new assessor comes on board who sees it differently than you right yep and and could that new assessor say well this is the way it's been done and this is the recommended methodology but this is a compelling reason to me is is that because of our county and, and our renewable resource capital of the northwest and that this tax shift is occurring that is unconscionable for the regular ratepayers and taxpayers of the county. Can you make that kind of a change? Because it seems to me like like it was it was wrong. Like we started out on the income methodology, and but, and but it wasn't even a full income. Sure, it wasn't a full income. I mean, but we started out on this methodology, mm -hmm. and then it changed from that to a depreciating scale. And so those that were already paying here got the benefit because they didn't have to pay this part because it's already been depreciated out down to here. So we got a big bump in revenue the first year, I recall, and that's what she was selling. We'll get a big bump in revenue. Uh, 
No. Darlene. No. Because no, we no, had a no, new one coming no, on board, didn't we? No. So yes, the only time you get a bump is when it's new construction, regardless of how it was assessed. Okay. So y'all got a bump the way Van assessed it because it was allowed to be new construction. The change that um, the prior assessor did, unless a new facility came on during her time, did not do anything with anybody getting an increase in their budget. I believe we had new ones coming on. We yeah, I, I think yeah. you did. Yeah. And, and yeah. so that was when she was selling it. She said, if we do it on this cost based method, then I get to do the whole amount right off the board. And that'll be the new construction and there'll be a big bump. Yeah, that's and true. And so, and then what I remember the conversation was, well, that's great for the first three years. And then what? Yeah. And then we make less yeah. money. Right. And she, well, you, once again, you don't make less because unless you all ask for less. Remember the, no, 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 the shift I, is sorry, the levy sorry, rate with the taxing sorry, yes. the the I, I meant, landowners. I meant that, we pay more yes. as taxpayers. Yes. You know, yes. We get the amount of money we get. So yeah. I guess I, I mean it could there uh, a, a new assessor or even myself we could look at that. What I look at is uniformity and 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 equity in the assessment world, and that's why I've chosen not to not to change it. Um, Kittitas County is going to have a solar facility, I believe, um, constructed this year. So they'll be, I believe, assessing it next year. They have some they're going to start being assessed next year. Yakima County has ones um, that are in the permitting process. I believe those have been permitted through the state, not the local. So they're going through even though Yakima County has a moratorium. Um, and so, you know, as more and more facilities are constructed within the state, I believe it will be looked at um, and, and they'll look at that in inequality for the citizens of the county. Because I always worry that, you know, if I was the business owner and say it was a mini storage unit or something, and and I was a, I was I was getting taxed on a depreciating method and I'm down at the 15% or say. And then a new assessor comes on board and says, well, you're on leased ground and we're going to assess you based on the income based method because we know how much money you make a year and what it is. And, and then your your so your taxes could bump up quite a significant amount. And I always worry about that legal jeopardy for us that we're we're you know saying that we're changing the method of taxation while it's still fair and accurate and uniform amongst all you know, many storage facilities, mm -hmm. you're still going to take a huge increase in your taxes. And is that something we have to worry about? Because I know that this is not going to end the... Um, the, the legalities obviously are not something that I can comment on. That's, right. I, I'm not an attorney. Um, however, my goal, the assessor's office goal is not to um, determine the the most, the, the, not to determine the way that taxing districts can get the most money. You know, we have assessment guidelines and those are what we need to stay within. We wouldn't change a way we assess something just because it would increase their value and possibly give districts more money if it was new construction. That's, that's not our purpose. Yes, highest and best use is part of our purpose. Um, and when a use changes, we do look at that. Um, I mean, I, 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 my recommendation would be that if, as commissioners, you all are proposing new legislature, is to make sure that you work with assessors on uniformity and equitability. The problem that the assessors voiced to me, because they all are like, what's your county doing and calling me and wanting to know, um, was that it was, there was choices in that the facility in the county could determine, well, we'll do it cost base, or we'll do it based on a, a PILT type um, way. And so you have some assessed this way and some that are just not even assessed at all, but they're paying through a contract agreement with the county. And so where was the uniformity and equitability in that? That was the concern of, of all the, the assessors that called me and wanted to know what, what was going on. They did, they did have concern with 
you know, if it's a smaller county with a potential tax shift, you know, like we have here, they were concerned about that. Um, so I'm not think I'm thinking it more of one large project yeah. that could, you know, almost put add 25 plus percent to the value of the county that over the course of 10 years can be depreciated out thus creating a huge because of the you know unless unless the new new valuation like you you add new construction the valuation goes up but you're not depreciating or you're not decreasing that value by how much they depreciate their and so that's see if you if you were if if the value of the county you know the, the overall assessed value was going down commiserate with the decrease in how much somebody is you know writing that down then I don't think you'd have the same issues right, because correct. the value of the county would be declining. But for some reason, we put a new a new value up here, and then you get to depreciate it out, but your value stays up here. No, it depreciates down, and and I'm a huge person in terminology. It doesn't depreciate out like you do with the, the, the IRS. Cost. It depreciates down to a fifteen percent in use value. It could be a little higher than that if you know the Department of Revenue takes a look at it and they determine a new trend um line for that particular thing right so it's it's depreciating down to its in essence sunk cost a 15 percent in use value right and and but but when we create that new valuation of the overall county correct the value you know it's a new construction the county's assessed total assessed value goes up mm -hmm. but this is depreciating down but the county's value, you're not depreciating that off of the county. Right. No, you're correct. correct. The the and so why is that? The real well, because real property is assessed based on 100 percent of market value, typically established by sales. So even though your structures depreciate, you then adjust them for the market, and so they don't, you know, keep going down. Right. So that's but that's the, I the mean, real but it is, side. but it is, but it is theoretically possible that the value could go. It's not. It's the. Well, the I think we're mixing apples and, and oranges, right, and goes we, down. But I think what we're really talking about the issue is always about it's the levy rate. It's not the. It doesn't matter if the what the like the like our levies are set to dollar figures, mm -hmm. as the goes up and down. We if the levy if the value goes up. It doesn't make we don't make more money unless it's new construction. Correct. It just changes the rate of what you're paying. Right. So if the value goes down, it doesn't change. It we still can we still have to generate X number right. of dollars. Right. If it's, it's like the until we hit the caps, which right. thankfully taxing, we've never done. But if the taxing districts never increased their budget and the assessed value of their district went down your levy rate would go up right to make if up the difference they did not once again change their budget and the assessed value of their district went up their levy rate would go down right and it's not you know as jake stated it's not equitable in the depreciation of the of the wind and solar facilities because their value is such a huge amount Out, of our county's right. value um it's it, it doesn't well i mean and that is i mean my argument with or at least my debate with the legislature over why they need to take a look at this is I don't think our system was ever designed for having personal property be such a huge no percentage no. of the, it it wasn't and it needs to be looked at yeah. because there are these unintended consequences where they it's it's like personal property is like an add-on it's like stuck on there typically is that the real value of this is in you know real estate and houses and stuff that depreciate but the market resets them and you end up with a pretty stable two rising values but then we in this county we added this thing that's personal property that is huge and it's like the system is just not built for that and it needs to be um amended and modified because of the problem that it's created and they're you know they at least were listening and i and i think yeah anything in the future we need to have the asset it really should be the assessors and the really kind of leading with the with well no i think so i i i understand commissioners are more i mean we need to be involved in in 
to be sure that you know what's proposed is uniform and equitable because I think once again that was the problem right. this year. But it ultimately is an assessment tool, which is in yeah. your area of authority. It's not. And, and I think that'll happen. Um, you know, right right now the DOR is just talking to um, stakeholders. They're not really including us. Um, I did say, why not? I so mean, we're not stakeholders. We're not a stakeholder. <laughs> Click Attack County assessor is not I a stakeholder. I asked why um, you know the counties were not involved in this, and I was told that they're not including the counties at this time. Hmm. Not that they might not be later i don't i don't know um but i think that you know in talking to all of the assessors this year that that was part of the conversation of of no one expected personal property to be such a huge part of the total assessed value of of the county as a whole um because we're we're a fairly small county not in size but in in population and i think that um I think that's definitely something that will be addressed and um, looked at. But I mean, there there is a process in place. There is a process that that's been in place. It's uniform. It's equitable. It's the way we're going to do it until they come up with. They have until January first, and they're just now starting meetings. So. Um, We'll see how that works. How well, that we'd works love out. to be considered a uh, stakeholder. Stakeholder. Email your DOR. Do you have any DOR contacts? No. Okay. I will um share those, please. Yes. Yes. No, I mean, because we both went through it with WASAC with trying to, you know, get legislation and you know, if the assessors go, whoa, 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 we don't like this, there's no way it's going to pass. Right. Oh, that was, and, was well, that's not true. Uh, some still does. <laughs> We're working through one of those right now. So, yes. It, yeah. It, but yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> but definitely. That's the um, exception that proves the rule. <laughs> yeah. But definitely um, work with assessors when, you know, on on, on proposals. I mean, it's not that I'm against changing it. It's it's just if we change it, you know, then so it's like, what do you what one do you choose? You know, because once again, my job isn't to choose the largest, right. the one that creates the biggest tax bill. That's not my job. It's uniformity and equity, equity and and. Um, but but in essence by the choice and following the recommendations, you create the largest tax bill for the regular taxpayer over the length of a project. Thanks, Jake. I mean, in essence, by following the recommendation of the state, that's what that's what ends up happening. And so and then, uniformity and equity be equity as well for those facilities. You know, that's what you're all forgetting. This is just another company that has personal property on leased land in our county. I'm not advocating for them at all. I mean, I know that it'll be twisted and said that, but that's not the case. It's that all commercial industrial property pays personal property and depreciates. It's a fact. So by by adding, oh, by the way. So then why is there the income-based method to begin with, if that's the case? For personal property? I have no idea. I, I mean, I wasn't here when they enacted the original, um, you know, ways to to assess things, but but personal property is by the cost cost method throughout the state. Is this why they don't want to own the land? I mean, I think of that when I had the construction company, I submitted my thing and it was all of my equipment and all mm -hmm. your chainsaws and oh, saw yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's, oh, yeah. it was what it costs and it's just on a depreciation thing. And I pay taxes based on, yeah. that's how it works. Yeah. So yeah, I get, it is, we have to always remember that is that it's, it has to be the same for everybody. Right, yeah. You and can't... that's my argument because I like to treat everybody the same. I don't care who you are who you are, who you know, who you right. don't know, how much money you do or do not have. I try to treat right. everybody the same. I mean, right. that's, and I completely I'm agree with that, but that. I do want the legislature to recognize that there is a problem. Right, with that process. With that process, and I'm not suggesting what the solution is, but there needs to be Somebody a solution. Somebody needs to, Somebody though. needs to have a solution. We made a stab at it, and it was yeah. didn't go real well. I mean, honestly, the, the easiest 
the easiest thing that I could think that would that would fix that is is as you depreciate, like with these massive projects that have a huge impact, as you depreciate that value, which might be millions of dollars down, which might be more than the value of new construction in the county that year, even. Yeah, it that, is. that should be coming off the top yeah. of what the assessed value of the county is, because that's personal property that you added to new construction that as this is depreciating down, if this is coming down as well, you'll keep you'll keep the same rate and everything would be square. Well, then you just you get rid of the new construction bump and that would fix that where you get more revenue when the project goes on, the district does, but it doesn't get added to the, it now is not the high water Maybe mark. Maybe a it's single just year a, bump. It's a single year bump. And then as it depreciates, you actually get less revenue and districts shouldn't count, county whoever should not count. Because that's really what, in the perfect world, that's what it should be. It should be not, that is not base stable funding be, without the shift going on. Right. And you should budget accordingly um, there are some districts that don't take their new construction bump. I they, mean, they don't, but I can guarantee you they may not, but they they only have the c control over the part that they control. Right. Yes. Not right. Because you can't State tell schools, all the other I can't districts. tell the other State districts. Doesn't get new construction. Well, but they, but it's also, yeah, I can't tell any other districts. Right. I can't say, oh, you school district, fire district, you're not taking your, your new construction bump. We can choose to not take it for the county general fund and the county road fund, which is you know, combined, you know, less than half of the total of what most people are paying. Right. But so we could mitigate it. So, although we need our new construction too. Well, that's what's keeping us above the <laughs> that's, 1%. Yeah. Exactly. So one of the things that can happen um, when property, uh, the, the way property is valued is changed is appeals. So um, if y'all remember, uh, we had um, a, like seven or eight, I think, facilities um that were assessed you know under van's way and then when when it was changed to the department of revenue's recommended methodology way we had an appeal um that was very significant and costly as well so i mean there's there is that out there so you want to have you know you want to be you want to be very firm on your on your value and your valuation when you when you go to change it and you should let the the um you know, like you said, all the stakeholders should be told if something like that is going to change. All right. As always, thank you so much for the discussion. And, and I just want to say if anybody wants to know anything about these facilities that I can legally give out, come into my office, Billy or I, Jessica, we are anybody in there, we are willing to give you the facts not what your neighbor's saying, not what a particular person is saying, but the actual facts of the matter. Thank you again. Adam, Thank you. Thank you. One of these days we'll remember everything you said. <laughs> yeah. But now we can come back to the video. I have two yeah. minutes. Go ahead. And you all are always welcome to come and have this. Oh, yeah. And I do. Yep. Prosecutor Canal, do we have? All right, we are back in session. Um, would you like to pay the bills? Okay. Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion to approve accounts payable warrants in the amount of $451,857.70 for the date ending August 8th, 2022. I will step down and second the motion. All those in favor of paying the bill say aye. 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 Motion carries. You want to do consent? Yes, please. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion to approve the consent agenda, um, all four items. There's a motion and I will step down and second the motion to approve the consent agenda with four items. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay. Uh, we want to sign the agreement. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have before us under unfinished, we have a before us an agreement between Click Attack County Public Health Department and Chris Devlin Nueva. 
for the purpose, and I apologize, um, Chris, for butchering your name, um, for the purpose of providing expertise and technical guidance on community-based behavioral health services in Klickitat County, the contractor will be paid at a rate of $125 an hour for approximately 20 hours a week, uh, not to exceed uh, $78,000. This is effective August 1st, 2022, uh, and ending January 1st, 2023. My motion is to approve and sign the agreement. I will step down and second the motion and all those in favor of signing the contractual agreement signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Do you have anything for board pending? Not anymore. <laughs> no. No, I'm good. Um, it has on here a potential executive session to discuss negotiations on a publicly bid contract as long as they determine a public discussion would cause the likelihood of increased cost 2023-2024. I'm happy with having that in open session. <laughs> Are you? I am. I... Really? Uh, yeah. But I I will defer to the. I'm fine either way. It's fine. I don't. I don't know other than. Um, I mean, yeah. I would like like a little bit of. Um, direction from the prosecutor is that something you feel would be best in executive session is that something you feel that could be an executive session Um, you have a desire to engage in I really don't my my you know based on the response that we received my I I'm not particularly interested in negotiate I'm I'm more interested in rejecting the offer and looking at a different you know and whether that needs to be an executive session as far as the what other alternative you know what are our alternatives but I don't but as far as um, yes, if we were going to have a discussion about the um, proposal or the response, then that should be an executive session. All right. I, if we're not, then it doesn't need to be. I, I don't think so, but I, I'll defer to the chair. I'm fine either way. I think it would be best if we uh, enter into uh, executive session in accordance with RCW 4231101D uh, to discuss negotiations on a publicly bid contract for 10 minutes. Okay. And just so everyone online knows, we will not be doing any more business when we come back. So uh, Zoom land is going to be shut off. I would say thank you to everyone for joining today's meeting and hopefully we all learned something. Um, thank you and have a great day. <laughs>